Howdy, Sifters, and welcome to Game Face, episode 354 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. We're here to deliver the best gaming discussion for the week, and it has actually turned out to be a pretty good week, Matt Kyle. I gotta tell you. Mm. Well, <laughs> when we left here last week, I was like, what am I even gonna play for the next week? And then there was like too much to play, mm -hmm. and it was a mad scramble getting here on time today to do this show. I literally showed up just in the nick of time to get everything set up, but here we are for Game Face 354. How has your week been? It's pretty good. A little yeah? busy. Yeah. Um, I didn't really get to play a whole lot, including Baldur's Gate. Oh, you didn't? Um, have you played more of it? I played it the night we did the show, and that's the last time I played it. Oh, okay. I actually did play a lot more, and we are going to discuss Baldur's Gate 3 one last time today on the show, because uh, I've played another 10 hours of it or something mm -hmm. like that. I've actually played a ton of games this week. For whatever reason, it just worked out that way. Again, uh, and part of it, too, is like you and I both played a game that we had review code for, but it's an online game, and it was mm -hmm. hard to get games. Well, and so played. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I played the lobby. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's about it. Yeah, and that sucked up a lot of time just sitting around waiting. Yeah. And um, But anyway, I think we have a great episode for you guys today. In fact, for once, for the first time in like probably two months, the housekeeping is a very short section of today's show. We actually have topics and games to discuss on this week's episode, Man, which is pretty I'm, exciting. I'm, I'm pretty much just continually opening doors on my Starfield advent calendar. So. <laughs> We're getting there. Two weeks. Yeah. I just reached out to Bethesda yesterday about review code, and hopefully they can get that to me a little bit early. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping. Um, one thing I will say about Bethesda is that it is allowed to stay the same. So it operates autonomously from Microsoft. Yeah. So all, all, my, all of Microsoft stuff does that for the most part. Yeah. So all my PR contacts that I have at Bethesda that I've built throughout the years, they're okay. still there. And they're still like, oh, yeah, we're the ones handing out the code and stuff. So it's good for us because we have great relationships with Bethesda as mm -hmm. a PR department. Um, and it's good for you guys, too, because that means we've got to discuss the game in a timely manner instead of having to wait. And I'm... I'm hoping well, that's the case. Well, you assure them if they give you an extra code for me, I will still buy the game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a problem. I, like, still, I still got that collector's edition coming. Yeah, yeah. Me. There will be a watch on this show uh, eventually. I mean, Matt, let's be honest. Smart PR people don't look at it like, I'm not going to give this to you, this code to you, because then you won't buy it. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're thinking. Right. Smart PR people. Right, right. <laughs> Smart PR people are like... We don't like, have that problem with Bethesda, but yeah. like, there's a lot of... There's, I've heard that excuse a couple yeah. of times. Well, smart PR people do their homework, and if they do the homework on Sifted, they see in our comments direct effect of them giving us review code. Because in almost every episode, you see someone in our comments who says, I'm buying this because you guys said to buy it. Almost every episode, either on Sifted.net or on YouTube, at least one person says... I'm buying this because you guys told me to buy it. Mm. And that's what smart PR people look for. They're not worried about losing $60 from us. They're like, how many $60 sales are you going to generate yeah. if we give you this code? So Although sometimes the opposite happens. Sorry, Larian. No, it's true. Um, I mean... Not that they need more sale. They're doing fine. But even if they see someone that says, like, I'm not buying this because the, of yeah, what... I mean, the influence is still It's there. the power yeah. and the influence is there. And that's what matters. Too smart PR people. And mm -hmm. look, there are some people that I worked with for, like, 20 years who, as soon as I launched this, they're like, sorry, mm -hmm. you're not getting review code anymore. Just because they're like, well, you went from, you know, your reviews doing 5 million views to this little thing that you're starting up. And they're like, come talk to us in like two years or whatever when you've built your own. I'm like, no. Like, it's, some people are very much like, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. And it hurts when these are people that you worked with and you got their games on television. Right. Which was something nobody else could do for them. And some of them are where they are now because of that. And got, right, and got promoted in mm -hmm. their jobs in PR because of the stuff that we were doing together that's when it hurts. Mm -hmm. But that's life. That's how business works sometimes. But again, the smart PR people work with Sifted. So it's been a crazy week for me trying to get through all this stuff. You're going to see it here on the show. We did have a topic on last week's show that didn't make it, and we're going to put that in here today. So we are tight as far as runtime today for today's show. Um, so housekeeping is going to be shorter. There's no name that game this week, unfortunately. So if you guys are tuning in just for name that game or you show up later on in the, in the show just to try to win a free game, we're not doing it this week. It's going to be tough for us to just fit 
everything into the runtime that we have today. And before we get going with housekeeping, let's take a look at what y'all are up to and what y'all are saying. Uh, put on my glasses for the rest of the episode now because I have to actually read small text. <laughs> I really hate having to wear reading glasses. It really sucks. It's annoying. Wow, lots of Twitch Prime for so far into the month. This is crazy. Wow, look at you guys. Everybody knows their budget now. Too Quick Capri, thank you for Twitch Prime. He actually reached out to me on YouTube a week or two ago and said, hey, I haven't been seeing my name in the bottom of Pactor Factor. And I went back and found three episodes just like that with his name in them. In fact, Too Quick Capri... The last two episodes we just published, it's only available for our patrons right now. Your name's in those two. So uh, thank you for subscribing to Twitch Prime, and you'll be in the next round as well. Caver, thank you for Twitch Prime. Commander Fett, thank you. Talimper, thank you. Veritas, thank you. Who else we got? Glottis21, Cinetike, AJ the Legend, Watson. I can't believe so many of you guys hadn't done it yet. Rosencrantz, thank you for subscribing at Tier 1. That's awesome. Uh, Vinraba. Lynn Jeff 99 Andy T. Monahan. Wow. Okay. Lots of Twitch Prime today. I'm surprised. Actually, I want to mention, before we move on, that we just got our payout for Twitch Prime yesterday, mm -hmm. and it was $100 more than the month before. So I had mentioned on the show, I would ask you guys, like, hey, some of you guys have stopped doing it. Can you start doing it again? You did. So thank you very much. And actually, I'm going to give you a round of applause for that. I'm telling you, what you guys do makes a difference to us. I know there are other Patreons where you just throw your four or five dollars into this hole with like a hundred thousand dollars and no one there knows who you are, no one appreciates you. It's all different here. We appreciate literally, I know almost every one of our patrons by name. It's crazy. I definitely know every single person who contributes at the thirty dollars or more tier. I know every single one of your names, every one of you. So thank you guys. It made a difference. Got to pay out yesterday, $100 more. Let's keep it rolling. It literally takes three seconds to subscribe with Twitch Prime. It's three seconds. It's really frustrating to think that people won't do that for us, Matt, to take three seconds to subscribe and give us free money. Like, mm -hmm. come on, man. I don't get it. I don't understand. Like, I get it if you didn't like the show or you hated us. That part, I get. if you mm -hmm. like the show and you're enjoying it, it takes three seconds, and it can make a world of difference I'm for us. I'm sure some people already subscribed to something else. Or you Maybe. You only get one shot with Twitch Prime. And, and look, I'll be honest month. with you. If you have decided that you'd rather give your Twitch Prime to somebody else for the month, totally got it. That's totally fine. Like, I'm not going to sit here and argue and say, we're better and we should get it. Like, I'm not going to say that. Um, but there are a lot of people, I think, who are just not doing it at all. They mm -hmm. just fall off, fell off and stopped doing it. And we saw the results of it this month. We got should, I mean, it month. should be easier. Yes, it should be. I mean, it, it should be. It can be, depending on which app you're using. But it well, should the biggest be. problem is that it doesn't work on the app. Right. You have to use a desktop to subscribe, mm -hmm. and that's it's the bizarre. dumbest. That's the dumbest thing of it all. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing. Like if you've gone on your app, you're like, I can't figure out how to do. You know how Shane? It's because you can't do it on the app. You have to do it on a desktop, or you can use the web browser on your phone to go to Twitch instead of using the Twitch app. But otherwise, yeah. You can only use it on desktop, which is annoying and stupid. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff about the Twitch Prime program that is annoying and stupid. Um, but anyway, it does help us ultimately. So thank you guys. Thanks to everybody who had not done it for a while and did it last month because it showed up in our pay and we really uh, appreciate to it. To avoid the 30% app store cut, says Mike's Q. That makes sense. To do what? To not allow it on the app. Uh, so you're not getting uh, the app store. So Apple doesn't take the 30% yeah. of the money. Yeah. Because it's the whole thing is absurd because yeah. you have the company handing itself the money mm -hmm. it's like amazon owns twitch and it's giving twitch the money it's yeah. like what what is going on it's so weird but anyway it is a huge help thanks to everybody who's doing it thanks to everybody who helped us out last month instead of maybe some other streamer we really appreciate it um and with that i think it's time to get to housekeeping um, like I said, we have a big episode today, so we can't spend too much time on the early part of the show. Thanks again to everybody. Gohan Rage, I see you got in there at the last minute. Thank you for Twitch Prime. Uh, let's see. Let's get to housekeeping. Uh, the first smaller story from this week, maybe isn't that small of a story, but I just don't think we're going to talk about it very long. And that is that a new version of PlayStation 5 appeared on Twitter this week. And now I have photos of it I'm going to share with you right now. Um, this came from Twitter account was well, not Twitter now it's called what X or whatever the hell it is it's Twitter <laughs> exactly at BWE underscore dev so I'm assuming this guy is a developer of some kind but he claims that he got his hands on the next revision of the PlayStation 5 now he was calling it 
the PlayStation 5 Slim. But after people actually started looking at these images a little more closely, people have decided that this is actually the updated PlayStation 5, where if you want a disk drive, you have to buy a disk drive separately mm -hmm. and attach it to the console. Um, I should explain why that looks so terrible. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing, too. And I, this, is, this made me think that it wasn't legit was that the way he holds it and handles it, there's nothing inside it. It's just a shell. It's just a shell, yeah. But he explains, yes, it is just a shell. I knew it was just a shell all along. It does have, like, the plastic, like, protective coating on it, like electronics get. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think, Matt? Do you think this is legit, or do you think this is just somebody 3D printing a fake? I think if you were going to 3D print a fake, you'd make something that looks more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is boring enough to be real. I, I think so, too. I mean, I'd say probably 60% real. I go that far, mm -hmm. but how how about the split shell? What do you think about that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not gonna buy one unless it's more powerful. And even then, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like from what they were saying, how there's that indent on the top that that's where the disc drive would sit if you installed the disc drive into it. I don't know. Isn't the disc drive the big giant thing on the side? I don't think so. I think I don't think it is. I think it's a split, just like on the other side. It's just mm. carrying the motif over from the front, I think. I don't know. But I went and read all the replies from this guy when people were like questioning him whether it was legit or not. Um, it satisfied me enough to show this on Game Face and say I think it's 60% real. I don't know. <laughs> Um, it does I mean, look I mean, a little I, I really don't care about some revision of the PlayStation 5 unless it's a massive boot, as a pro more mm -hmm. than a slim kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and until Sony actually says something about it, whatever. The only thing that really matters with this is the detachable disk drive and the idea that Which it could... knew about. And the idea that it could be cheaper, that they could drop the price for it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you're pretty right. Like, there's not a big story here. And my guess would be if I had to, if someone said, hey, Shane, draw the PS5 Slim. Right. That's probably what it would look like. Yeah. Well, no, well like, the, the other thing is, like, I mean, I guess the PS, the Pro sort of. But, like, usually Sony's, like, Slim redesigns are drastically different. Mm -hmm. Like, you really want people to be able to tell the difference when they look at the box on the shelf. And this is way too close to the original to, unless you intend to literally replace the original with this model, mm -hmm. which I guess is possible. Which they probably would, yeah. But like, yeah, I don't know. Then you do want it to kind of look similar. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like much of a change. It really doesn't. I mean, if this is a 3D printed fake, they went so far as to, like, screen print the stuff on the bottom of the console. That's definitely going the extra step that a lot of people mm -hmm. wouldn't go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And, like, who knows, like... Part of me looks at it and it's just like it looks like one of those knockoff consoles you'd buy, for like, <laughs> like a flea market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flea, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, like yeah. or you see like a weirdo ad on Facebook for, and you're like PlayStation Five authentic for yeah. like a hundred dollars. You're like, well, that's bullshit. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like it's just, it just, like, and again, it really like it's such a weird thing to care about. You yeah. Know? It's just like, oh, this might be yeah. the shell of a thing. That you might Most want. of you don't even <laughs> probably want to buy. It's like, well, yeah. who cares? Like, yeah. it just seems like meat for engagement with the um, with the crazy weirdos who you know the ponies. So to speak. yeah, like I uh, you know, having accidentally dropped into the East console war space of Twitter a few months ago, I'm like, oh y'all crazy. Yeah, like really crazy. It is nuts. Like if you like it. I mean, I was involved in the console wars before the Genesis and the Super Nintendo and the Saturn, PlayStation, mm -hmm. uh, N64 era, but like. This is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. Like, it, it wasn't corporate cheerleading quite the same way. It was defending the toy you owned. Yeah. This is like people get into shareholder shit. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, unless you are one, I don't know what you're so obsessed <laughs> about. Like, it just save up and buy the other fucking console at this point. We're part. very insulated from that. Yeah. People have figured out that Sifted is not the place to go if you're a fanboy. They've just figured it out. Like, every once in a while, we'll get a comment on the YouTube version of it where it's just, like, blatantly obvious that they're, like, Pactor Factor, we get more bleed-in than Game Face. Yeah, it's uh, uh, as though... Michael Pactor spends a minute of his day worrying about which console is better. You know, like that is so furthest from his mind. Yeah, yeah, because he doesn't have to decide on anything. He just like buys he's it sitting all. on the back of his boat with scotch, being like, <laughs> hmm. "The PlayStation really is superior." It's just like, no, it's not. I promise you. Well, or they also would think that he's actually reading their comments, which, <laughs> yeah, that's, all, that's also bubble, but that's even funnier. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's not happening. Like he has, uh, like he has someone to read the comments to him on the back of the boat. Yeah, yeah. Drinks. That's that's his that's his Sunday. <laughs> that's me. <Yeah. laughs> uh, so anyway, um, I think it's more likely that it's the slim because it feels to me that if well, the the PS4 Pro looked pretty similar to the PS4 actually. It just had that extra stack on top yeah. of it basically. So. Uh, maybe I guess it could be maybe the pro, um, but again, I, I'm comfortable saying sixty percent that that thing's legit. I'll say one thing: if this guy is is faking, he's gonna mm. have a lot of egg on his face. But he'll already, you know, he already. I mean, a lot of the I don't know if he's subscribed on Twitter or whatever, but you know, the a lot of the stuff is like when you're posting bait on mm -hmm. Twitter now is because you have the subscribe feature. And you get money for engagement, right? Like that's that's a big thing on the right wing now. It's like post really crazy shit, and so you get lots farm of farm engagement because right. every time you every time someone looks at your post, it clicks over. You, you know? get like so an eighth of a penny or whatever. Yeah, but like, yeah. there's people that make thousands of dollars doing. Well, yeah, if you have a million so like, followers or whatever. So yeah, some of that that that's one of the new grifts. Is that so? I definitely see someone like just crap post mocking all day, up, and... mocking up a fake P PlayStation yeah. Slim to like you know try to get into that payout. Bracket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see Assuming that. Elon's actually sending anybody any real money in yeah. the first place. <laughs> but like, so that's pot, you know, that's another thing you got to look out for now is, you know, there used to be sort of like, well, what's the point of doing like a scam like that? Well, it would be other than like cloud or whatever. Well, now there's actual money on the line. Yeah. So. Or you could just leave, which is what I've pretty much done. I pretty much only post on Blue Sky at this point. So um, anyway, um, that's the closest thing we've got to a look at the next PlayStation 5. It could be a Slim, it could be a Pro, we don't really know. Although the person who showed that seemed to think that it was the Slim that he had a case for. We will find out. I think we'll know more about this in the next couple months. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't hear anything by the end of the year, then it was all a bunch of hogwash, I think. Probably. So, got a few months here to make hay. God help you if you try to waste my time on a PS Slim <laughs> announcement in early September. Oh, I was like, I'm sorry, I could be in space right now. Yeah. <laughs> but you want me to look at this crap? Yeah. All right. You either show me Ghost of Tsushima 2 right now, or I'm going back to Starfield. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Uh, next up, we got our first glimpse at Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 this week. It's um, a lot like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. It really does. Also, as we mentioned in a prior episode of Game Phase, all your loadouts and stuff are going to continue over to Modern Warfare 3. And this prompted some people to question whether the game would be $70 this year. Because oh. last year's game was 70 bucks. <laughs> That oh, was have, foolish. Have, have you met Activision? <laughs> and to there, answer that question... Microsoft doesn't own them yet. Like, yeah. hang on. Yep, and to answer that question, yes, the game is $70 again this year. And to just answer that question in perpetuity, Call of Duty is going to cost $70 yeah, or more until the end of time. Never a reason to not. Yes. In fact, today's episode of Pactor Factor that went up, somebody asked, what is going to be the first franchise mm -hmm. that asked for $100 for the game for a year? And I'm not going to spoil the episode, but... The timing is pretty impeccable for Pactor Factor today. GJ6. <laughs> for maybe. Um, or just GTA. I mean, I don't GTA. know what, for one way or the other, but like, let's be honest. GTA 6 could cost whatever it wants to. I think Call of Duty probably might be able to get away with it, too. People think, are just I so... Don't know, I don't know if Microsoft would go that way with it. I think Activision would, oh, given, yeah. given enough time. Uh -huh. But I don't, know if, I don't know if Microsoft will do that. I mean, it would sell less, but the amount of extra money they'd make... They, it would more than cover the people who Microsoft didn't buy Microsoft would rather not have the scrutiny. Right. You know? Yeah. Especially yeah. after... After all the all FTC All the stuff shit. they've gone like, through for that deal. And then deal. you're like, oh, if you was like, it's like, oh, it's $100. We raised the price by 30%. Uh, yeah, no, it's, that, I don't think that's going to happen yeah. under, under Microsoft. But yeah, they could. Like, that's definitely something I could see Activision doing if they were still running themselves. Yeah, and if you can't tell, the star of that trailer is Makarov, which is yeah. a little odd because... They, they show a glimpse of no Russian in that trailer. And that was from Modern Warfare 2. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they may bring back no Russian for Modern Warfare 3's kind of rework, remake, mm -hmm. re whatever the hell it is. I don't even know how I mean, what you would I mean, call these anymore. I mean, it's basically a re... I mean, imagining. story-wise, story it's a remake or a reimagining. It's like, it's like oh, we're, there's different elements. We're going to do this or that. But like we're not beholden to anything in the original story. Mm -hmm. It's just the same characters going through a similar situation basically. Yeah. Um and various things can fall away. I mean it's almost like a revision. Yeah. Of it's like oh if we did this today well, this is how we tell the story. Yeah. Um so I don't know. They're I, I mean, lines they always bit. really try even back in the the originals they really tried hard to make Makarov like a a 
like a memorable ongoing almost bond villain level like antagonist i don't know if they really succeeded on that because uh, i can't really tell you a whole lot about him you know from my previous modern warfare playing other than the fact that you shoot his arm off at one yeah. point um but like i, I mean know. he's the number one bad guy in call of duty as far as i'm concerned like if somebody asked me like what's a call of duty villain makarov is the first name that comes to my mind mm. and it doesn't really matter if like whether it's black gen- ops or modern warfare or whatever i think of the general the the traitor general from two but you can't remember his name. No, but I also would never <laughs> remember Makarov's name okay. unless you just said it. Fair enough. So I would remember okay. the guy whose army, the Russian guy whose army shoot off. Yeah. And the general who turns out to be behind all of it. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I don't know. Yep. Um, so anyway, the full. Oh, and Kit Harrington. <laughs> <laughs> the, vi- the real villain. Yeah, yeah. Of everything. Yeah, the full blowout of Modern Warfare 3 is coming up very soon on August 17th. So that's when we'll get like the full rush of information about exactly what it is, how pulling the stuff you've unlocked in modern warfare 2 goes into how that stuff works um i think there's a little bit of confusion around that i'm not 100 percent sure how that's supposed to happen like are they literally just going to give you everything and then like you have nothing to unlock except for like the crazy weapons in modern warfare 3 like Mm. it seems weird because truth be told like unlocking stuff still motivates me to keep playing the multiplayer even after all these years i'm sure there will be new bars to fill up yeah in the in the new i'm just wondering what those bars will be for I don't know. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. But again, August it'd be, 17th. It'd be fun if like all you get all the stuff from the last game, but there's a bunch of all this new stuff to unlock and it's all like markedly better than everything in the previous game. So like, yeah. you can use your old stuff if you want, but it all sucks now. Like, yeah. That would be very Activision. Yeah, it would be. Forcing you then to start filling bars yeah. again. <laughs> so anyway, we'll see how that works out just a couple days away till we get the full blowout of that uh next up overwatch 2 finally launched on pc in fact really the bigger story matt is that blizzard finally launched on steam Mm -hmm. and it has not gone well for overwatch 2 it has been review bombed who could have predicted despite the fact and this is the interesting part matt there are tons of people playing the game Mm -hmm. like the actual numbers on steam are great as far as like how many people are playing they're just all giving it like horrible reviews when they could actually evaluate it no baldur's gate yeah um i I also read a thing that a very large chunk of like like maybe 80 percent of the negative reviews are from china oh and a lot of chinese players have a grudge against blizzard because they stop support in china Mm. and so this is the first time they've had an actual public forum particularly a western facing one where they can make their feelings known and and like 80 percent of the remaining reviews are also negative it's not like they're the only ones being negative like it but but that is apparently a large uh cohort in in the negative reviews is chinese players that feel like they've been snubbed and disrespected by blizzard and their policies there no um and even to this day they're still stuck playing on international servers there are no china servers um so some of it is that some of it is like now we can finally hit you where it maybe doesn't hurt but like also by the way your boy shane just got an 11 player kill streak (laughs) right there wow (laughs) so that's some of some of it's their previous policies coming home to roost yeah um i mean but again overwatch remains one of the biggest like ball drops unforced errors in the history of games um so that might be a little bit of a stretch but i can't it's think, up in I that upper echelon that's for sure i can't think of one that went from like top of the heap to ice cold everybody loved it to everybody hated as it fast yeah i mean you may be right i actually still enjoy playing overwatch there's just so many other games there's just so much competition anymore to play shooters it's just well, it like seems like valorant has really sort of taken over in the esports realm a little bit yeah um, which i have not i played it for a couple of days i didn't really enjoy it all that much it had that old school counter-strike vibe to me yeah, I can see. Which I, I never I've resonated never, with either. I've never played it because yeah. obviously I do not yeah. care. <laughs> I'm not surprised to hear um, that. But uh, I, I hear it mentioned way more and way more positively than Overwatch these days. Yeah. Um, I did not enjoy Valorant. I do like Overwatch more than Valorant. And if you don't know, Valorant is Riot's first person shooter. And it is very much like Counter Strike. It was definitely a response to Counter Strike, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, good and bad for Overwatch 2, <laughs> like <laughs> on Steam. 
Like, I guess you want ultimately people playing because they're engaged. Yeah, Hopefully I mean, they spend money on microtransactions. There's, there's an element where they're sort of just taking their lumps here. And it's not like anybody really cares what the reviews of anything say, especially yeah. something this high profile. It's like mm-hmm. everybody knows whether they want or like Overwatch 2 or not. Yeah. It's not like anyone's looking at Overwatch 2 and be like, oh, no, people don't like the game. Maybe I won't buy it. It's like no yeah. one's doing that. That's for, like, weird visual novels and shit you know, yeah. you've never heard of. They need this to hit, though, because they just mentioned recently that engagement for Overwatch is falling off a cliff right now. And so I think that's probably what prompted them to release it on Steam in the first place. And, mm-hmm. I mean, despite review bombs, so far so good, it kind of sounds like. like I think they've accomplished their goal, which is just getting more people to play it. And hopefully, ultimately, spend more money on it or spend some money on it. So, um, we'll see how it goes because we're still in the honeymoon period for that game on Steam right now. We'll see in like a week or two if people are still hanging around. That'll yeah. be that's when the rubber will, will hit the road. So, yeah, to Blizzard speak. has a hard time with the long game. Yep. See also Diablo 4. Yeah, because it's falling on his face right now, yeah, which again. is it's so funny. I have a friend on Facebook who is in the games industry. And he started playing Diablo 4. He got early code somehow from Blizzard or whatever. And every day, it's like, I hate Diablo 4. Diablo 4 <laughs> is the worst. His last post was, after 400 hours, I'm never playing Diablo 4 again. Oh it's God. like, no, dude, you played 400 hours. You liked it. Well, I'm yeah. sorry. I, yeah, I hate to tell you. I have you. not done anything I dislike for 400 hours. <laughs> it's like all these people. Except can... maybe certain jobs. Look, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, I get that there are some people who play Diablo for the post-game stuff. That's what They just suffer yeah. through the campaign, and then they want to play the post. I totally understand where those people are pissed off. For the rest of us, though, most of us played that game for like 50 hours. Like, if you played that much, and you paid 60 or $70 for something, you, one, you liked the game, and two, you got your money's worth. Mm-hmm. End of story. That's all there is to it. Yeah. So it's interesting to see how people have been reacting to Diablo 4 after playing it for 100 hours. It sucks. He's like, no, it didn't suck. This part of it sucks. But you enjoyed all the other parts that came before this sucky part. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting anyway, the psychology of the consumer. I mean, it can ruin a lot. In the end, a bad ending can ruin some things. But Yeah. As we've learned with Game Mass of- Effect 3 and some other games. Well, Mass Effect 3's ending is fine. But like, I'm thinking more like Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, certainly, I, I believe in the argument and agree with it that Mass Effect 3's ending should have been better than just fine. Yeah. But um, no, I'm thinking about Game of Thrones. It goes back. Like, for me, the movie Sunshine, whose entire third act ruins what otherwise is an amazing sci-fi movie for the mm-hmm. first two acts, uh, it, it colors. It can color things. I mean, I think, it, I think to your point, it colored Game of Thrones. I think some oh, people yeah. look at the entire series differently now oh, yeah. only because of that last season i will never watch that show again but well, because of the way it ended yeah and i don't usually have that. i don't usually have a thing like oh the ending it's not like i'm not going to watch star wars movies again because rise of skywalker sucks uh-huh. but like for whatever reason because game of thrones is so centered on character work character development political machinations like driving to the next thing to like then that results in this that makes everybody have to react to this and now we have to, it's so plot driven and the but the plot was determined by how who the characters were when I know that that all breaks down in the last two seasons, there's no reason to watch the beginning of that yeah. show. You had stopped watching that show way before that, though. I stopped watching it at the end of season four, and then I came back for the Battle of the Bastards, which, by the way, was seven years ago. Um, and uh, and I kind of more or less stuck with it through season seven and then season eight. And season seven was sort of like, oh, this isn't very good, but maybe if, can, if they can stick the landing, it'll be okay. To stick around. Uh, they, they did not stick the landing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They just stuck King's Landing, am I right? <laughs> um, but like, it's just I'm now I'm like, if if Martin ever brings those books out, I'll read them to see mm-hmm. his, his take on it because I'm sure it's better. And mm-hmm. yeah, you know, they were just working. If he ever brings those books well, out, well, that's the thing. It's like, look, man, I know people I'm really are, starting to wonder. I know people get mad at him, but I'm like, dude, if I'd been writing that fantasy yeah. crap my whole life and finally I was rich and famous and could do whatever I wanted, and I was like in my 60s or whatever he is, like I wouldn't fucking. I wouldn't sit down and bust my ass to write two more books for these assholes just going to yell at me on the internet for the no rest of No matter what. Yeah. Like, you know what I do? I would write those books, put them in a fucking vault. Wait for me to die. Wait for me to die, <laughs> then publish them with a little note. Now I don't have to listen to you fuckers. And, like, that's it. I'm just done. Like, the foreword. That's all right, it is. That's all it is. <laughs> like, I didn't want to deal with the bullshit. Now I don't have to. Yeah. Here's your fucking books, dickheads. <laughs> like, great. that would be exactly what I'd do. Yep. Um, okay, more housekeeping for this week's episode. Um, Baldur's Gate 3 is now the best rated game ever. Yep. What do you think about that? 
<laughs> it just passed all the Zelda games. It's the highest rated game ever. I mean, I think it's silly that the Zelda games were the highest rated games yeah. ever, too. But I was like, mm-hmm. Wait, whatever, sure. I yeah. don't care, whatever. Are you surprised? No, not really. If you remember, like, back when I first played the Early Access, I said, keep your eye on this one. We're talking, you about, did. We're talking about best RPG ever candidate. You've been here. saying it all along. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Do I agree with it? Unfortunately, no. Like, yeah. I don't actually like it all that much. Although... I mean, someone, I don't remember who it was in the comments of the episode on Sift, the Sifted site recommended, oh, you should use Mod to add this uh, dice, always, dice always roll in your favor mm. thing. Oh, believe me, I, I already did that the, the, the <laughs> night of the show. Like, I played it legit until we talked about it on the show, and I was like, I am modding you no, fuck out of No, bets are game. off. <laughs> and I played it that night, and I did, I, it, it was more fun. Yeah. Uh, when I could turn that on and off and like be like, I don't want to lose this. Di-. You know, I don't care about it in combat, but I don't want to lose this dialogue check because my, I want my character to say this. Yeah, I'm going to pass this check. So that was, yeah, I was able to tweak it until it did it did the way I wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if you're playing on PS5, you can't. You're stuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. But if nobody's playing it on PS5 yet. So not yet. But um, so yeah, that did make it better for me. But in ter- uh, it, rating, the, rating, the, the ratings, this thing is getting are accurate in terms of a, an accomplishment in terms of like what they've achieved here but in terms of what the game is i do not agree with it I, yeah you know, no, that's ridiculous i mean it's probably not in my top 20 games of all time no no i would i mean i would up me i was i'd up to but it's around there we're gonna talk about it again a little bit later not as long as we did last week but at least for 15 minutes or so because i have continued playing it this week um and my opinions on some stuff have changed a little bit um mm. and so we'll address that a little later on in the show but i agree with you i think it's crazy that it's the highest reviewed game ever yeah but the highest reviewed anything ever is often a weird outlier yeah. for certain i mean look, go look at the highest what's the highest reviewed movie on imdb shawshank redemption right i yeah. mean it's not like i'm saying that's a bad movie or right anything, right but, but the best movie ever <laughs> yeah, yeah really i hear you for a really? lot of people i can see where they would think it is though sure and some of that's also just the demographic that uses imdb or just the demographic of the the average moviegoer no like, they're the demo- not it's the demographic of the average male movie nerd oh that's what that is really yes Shawsha- i thought it would be casuals voting no. that up no not not um, casuals to me would think shawshank redemption is the best movie ever well but I, people I, who really know cinema would i not. have i have a secret to tell you about the average uh, male movie nerd <laughs> what is it casuals really they don't know shit about movies are you interesting kidding? go look at the top 10 movies on that, and that's all for, voted by people that think they're the hardest core right. set of files in the world, but it's the most fucking baseline, <laughs> casual ass well, top you 10. You said list. Shawshank Redemption, that's all you need to say. Right, but yeah. everything else, like, like you know, the joke in Barbie about how the, they all want to watch The Godfather with the girls and talk through the whole thing, that is the truest, one of the truest things in that fucking movie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I still haven't seen it. It, it is, keeps it just mowing down the money, though. Holy oh, it's, crap, it's, man. It's, it's a, a juggernaut. phenomenon, and they're all, all the studios are learning the absolute wrong lesson which is let's make movies about dolls the 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 lesson is make movies for women right that's 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 what happened here Uh it was not because it was not about dolls or whatever yeah if it was because it was about a toy that transformers movie would have done better a month earlier come on (laughs) people yep uh so anyway Baldur's gate 3 right now the highest reviewed game of all time kind of crazy um we talk about it seems like we talk about assassin's creed mirage in the housekeeping every single week maybe that's to ubisoft's mm. credit that it manages to keep it in the headlines it's the ubisoft secret yeah the headline for it this week what is, else are they talking about yeah exactly uh well the big headline for assassin's creed mirage this week is that they have moved up the release yeah. date by a week this Don't is the second often. this is the second game in like the last month to move its release date up yeah but the first one was Baldur's gate that worked out right? pretty well so. <laughs> it sure did um so now it is releasing on october 5th it was supposed to come out on october 12th and my guess is this is purely just to get it away from some of the competition in october because matt i really think october might be the greatest month of video game releases in the history of the video it's game very industry packed i mean it's insane really um but yes i do think it's it's to pull it away from the pack and it's priced competitively as well yeah so So i and i think it'll work i think it will give it a little bit of a window there before people start diving into october but we'll see you're right Mm -hmm. it's not 100 percent, but i think it'll give it at least a chance i mean 50 bucks and ahead of the pack you got a shot shot. especially if the the reviews reviews are good good. if the reviews aren't good though yeah you're in deep If 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 the social media buzz on it is solid i think you'll get a lot of impulse buys or people like that were turned off by the ancient trilogy that are like willing to jump back into a more classic version Mm -hmm. and then if they don't like it after that it doesn't matter they already got their money yeah that's true so anyway 
Assassin's Creed Mirage now releasing October 5th instead of October 12th, so remember that. And then our final story, I told you housekeeping was shorter this week. Our final story for housekeeping is that Rockstar has bought popular modders that it once went after and sued for modding its games. It bought them. What does that tell you about Grand Theft Auto 6? Um, it tells me that it's an abusive relationship. <laughs> Um, I mean, that, m hiring the modders makes a lot of sense. I always thought that Nintendo should have done that with the people that remade Metroid 2. Because mm -hmm. um, guess what? They're making better Metroidvanias than you are. Yeah, it's true. Um, I didn't realize how true that was until I played Metroid Dread. But, like, it's just... Sure. I mean, if you find people that can really handle your tech that well, why not? Um, maybe don't sue them first. But, like... It makes sense. But what do you think this means for the... Because, look, they Rockstar did this for a strategic reason. It it feels it needs these great modders as a part of its company, officially. I think purely because they can work with their tech very well. Do you think that user UGC is going to be a huge component of Grand Theft Auto 6? UGC? Yeah, user-generated content. No, not at all. Okay, so this why would... A, because they want people who are really good with working with their tech. That's wow. what these guys are. Interesting. But... Because I'm sure... I'm, I'm just wondering what they would do. They're not better than they, their programmers, obviously, well, who are building might, the games. They might be as good, and that's another group of people that can do stuff that maybe makes uh, GTA 6 Online attempting resubscribe at some point. Hmm. I'm imagining... I imagine because they're good at working with the existing tech and what's already put in front of them to mod things, that's the kind of team I would have making online content to do like paid expansions in the future. Hmm. Or at the very least, starting out with prototyping it and then maybe having my main team, you know, shape it into something that's retail sellable. You know what I mean? Interesting. So I really, I really thought it was because GTA 6 is going to have a huge that, building that, component not, to it. Never. Never. Really? Never. Even after all, like that Zelda is, that is the, and that everything? Is the, no, never. Really? Never. That is the opposite of Rockstar. Interesting. Never. Uh, the, but the most you're going to get that thing where you can design a mini game thing. Like... And maybe that's something they'd have them work on, you know, where you put the ramps everywhere and shit like that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a more robust version of that in there. But, like, Rockstar thinks that they are architects of grand creations. Mm -hmm. like no, they, I agree with that. They are not going to have user creations be a focus of anything. I, that would be a massive shift in attitude of the of the company that I just can't see. Although maybe now that the housers are gone, right. like that could be, but I just don't see that. Well, one of the housers. There the one of the one of the key elements of Rockstar's attitude is no one does this better than us. And mm -hmm. that includes everyone who plays their game. Yeah. Like that would be that would countermand the egos of that company in a way that I just can't, I, you're talking about a change in the company culture and outlook that I just can't fathom. I just wonder if I could see, be wrong, but I, yeah. I just don't see it that way. I just wonder if you, they've seen Zelda sell like it has with its fiddle, stuff that you can fiddle around with. No, it's too, and, it would be too late to implement anything like that. Well, I mean, they could have been working on it all along after Breath I, of the Wild. I mean, no, that's not no, that's not that's not what they do. I mean, these, these people still want you to hammer the A button to run. They're not, they're not <laughs> keeping up with industry trends. I mean, come on. No. Um, it might be smart for Rockstar to actually do it, though. I mean, Maybe. with the way I things mean, are it, going right now with the youngins. This thing could be socks in a box and it would sell 40 million copies. <laughs> no, you're right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, they're just going to make GTA again and then and, and just focus on online again for the next 10 years. Interesting. And probably sell you another remaster of five. Do you think maybe they're hiring these people to work on GTA online content? That's what I said. Oh, I thought you meant just like generally throughout the game, like you want them to work on like. No, I said get you to subscribe and... to GTA Online. Oh, like, okay. Like, like mods, like, like the heist crap. Like yeah. Stuff, stuff like that. That stuff's a little rough around the edges. It's not like polished rock star right. level stuff oh, typically. Yeah. But that's exactly what you'd get from kind of a modern. Right. Like, that's what I'm saying. You know, basically, it, I mean, that's one of the reasons I think you bring them in this late in the game is like you're, they're not going to be building anything in GTA 6. They're going to be working with a mostly finished game. They're like, here are the components you can play with. You know, what would you want to do with it? Well, how, mm -hmm. how do you how do you mix this jigsaw puzzle up and make something new out of it with maybe a few new additions we can throw in? Yeah, like that. I mean, I, I would see them as doing stuff like the heist, like updates kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Nevertheless, it is an about turn by Rockstar. I mean, to go from suing these literally mm -hmm. they sued these people. Not a thing that happens. And then the years game. later, they buy them. I mean, that just is very out of the ordinary. So. To me, it shows some kind of a shift with what Rockstar is doing for them to want to sue people and then to want to have mm -hmm. them as part of the team. There's something that's changing there. 
Um, we'll have to wait and see what it is. More rumors, by the way, swirled this week that Grand Theft Auto 6 has come. Actually, it wasn't even rumors. It was the financial report, and the CEO of, Ta- of Take-Two once again doubled down that we are going to have a huge influx of cash around the end of 2024 and early 2025. Mm-hmm. So it That's really— exactly what he said in that previous call. I mean, that was what everybody misinterpreted because nobody knows how financial fiscal years work. Yeah. But it was all—you know— Some Q, people Q, thought Q, early next 2024, no, Q1 but no. I mean, they said fiscal year 2025, mm-hmm. which means, you know— the the year the 2025 is part of the year or no they said fiscal year 2024 yeah which spills over into the beginning of 2025 right so q q1 2025 is when this thing's yeah. coming yeah um, so it looks like that's their plan yeah and it looks usually like we're only about 15 their, months away it would be very silly to not hit that target if you've already told your shareholders that gta money is coming in in this particular quarter twice mm-hmm. um so i would say it's a pretty sure bet we're getting that sucker in march 2025 yeah Best case scenario, like Hell Q, Q4 water. of next year. Yeah. I mean, if they can, yeah, but I think we'll see what, what the schedule looks like next year. I mean, I imagine next year's schedule will not be. This <laughs> well, you year. know what Rockstar's schedule is going to look like? Empty. Empty, yeah. <laughs> but Rockstar's going to want to launch by itself, and everyone else is going to want to get away from Rockstar. Yeah. So it's ba- I think you're basically going to. They can put it out in the fall, they can put it out in the spring, whichever they think is. It won't really matter. Whatever, yeah. Wherever the 800 pound gorilla wants to go, but you know, it's not like Call of Duty is going to move. It's not like some yeah. of these holiday releases are going to move. But if you put that out in March, everybody's going to poof, like disappear to January and May. Yeah. And you'll have that whole spring to yourself. So yeah. I think that's pretty much where you can count on it. I mean, GTA 6, they'll have the whole year and then the next year. To mm-hmm. themselves, basically, because there's no other franchise that competes with. Well, you're Grand you're Demotic. basically releasing a completely different product from the rest of the industry. It's true, like it's its own thing. Mm-hmm. You can't touch it. It's, yep. Everything else will sell around it. Yeah. Yep. Well, there you go. That's our housekeeping for episode 354. We're just about to jump into the main. Neighbor heart. makes a good good point. Horizon Zero Dawn Three will release a week before it. Because that, that's, <laughs> that's when Horizon releases. Oh, we gotta show this thing. Who said that? Uh, the Abram. Nice. <laughs> Good one, Abram. i to show this thing off. This arrived, Oh, yeah. This Let me cut to your yesterday. camera here. This is, you can't really read it, but it's called A Gamer's Journey, Sh- The Definitive History of Shenmue. And I ordered this, I kickstarted this in 2018. It was supposed to arrive in June 2019. It arrived yesterday. <laughs> Um, Five years late. I haven't watched it. Uh, they did put the digital cut of this up like a year ago. Yeah. So it was, it was been done for a while, but they had a, the Where did they put it up? On Kickstarter? On their, no, it was on their own, like, kind of... You could, they sent you a link if you're a backer, and you could okay. access it that way. Okay, got you. So other people um, couldn't watch it. Yeah. And uh, so I, obviously I haven't opened it yet, but they did finally deliver a Blu-ray. <laughs> Five definitive, years later. Definitive making of Shenmue. Yeah. Um, if anyone still cares, yeah, nobody does. Um, I mean, I'll watch. I'll watch it, but like, because it's it's more about one and two, right? Than, which care. actually, I would watch two. Yeah. Actually, and part of the part of the thing was that they started this in like 2017 and didn't realize they were going to have to cover a new game. Like, part mm-hmm. of the reason they started the project was to try to drum up interest to get Shenmue three made, right? And, and then that Shenmue just three, yeah, was a you know, it's like, oh, it is happening. So they kind of had to they, they had to call an audible a little bit. Let's be but, honest, Matt. If they had waited until now to release the video game, it might be decent. Well, all you need to do to make that game decent halfway is to take the stamina bar out of it. Um, I don't know if that would make it decent. Well, I don't know because I couldn't play more of it because the stamina bar is so annoying. I quit after like an hour and a half because like that sucks. Yeah. That's, that's the, one that of the is, biggest That is one of the dumbest game mechanics I have ever seen in my entire life. That and whole game is one of the biggest disappointments for me from the last like 20 years. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's Arkham Knight level disappointment yep. for me. Yeah. Um, I always say that Arkham Knight's the most disappointing game of that that generation. Shenmue 3 is probably in there, but like I expected better from Rocksteady than I did from like, you know, 20 years later. A bunch of ragtag. If I'm being on it. You know, I'm a big <laughs> Shenmue fan, but come on. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Okay, well, that's it actually now for housekeeping. And it's time to move on to the bulk of the show. And we have a big bulk of the show today to get to. But before that, here's a word from our awesome sponsor, LS Cream. LS Cream is a fine cream liqueur created by fellow gamer and sifter Stevens Charles. It's inspired by an ancestral recipe from Haiti called Cray Mass. 
and a double gold winner for its original taste at the New York Wine and Spirit International Competition. Ellis Cream can be enjoyed on the rocks or as a mixer for drinks with its rich blend of fresh cream and neutral grain spirits with notes of coconut, vanilla, cinnamon, and nutmeg. It's great in coffee or to make espresso martinis. To learn more, discover amazing drink recipes, or to track down your own bottle using a handy store locator, head to creamls.com slash sifted. That's creamls.com slash sifted. That's right, sifters. Go to creamls.com slash sifted, S-I-F-T-D. Make sure you use that URL when you go to check out LS Cream. That website is awesome. I've said it before, I'll say it a million times. It's a really cool website. You can get a lot out of it. In fact, I had never even, I don't think I had ever even visited a liquor's website before. <laughs> Seriously, like, it's like, I know I like Grey Goose. And if I can't yeah. afford Grey Goose at the time, then I'll Not get Stoli like, or Tito's. What are, what like, are you up to, Jim Beam? Right. I'm gonna catch up. <laughs> but LS Cream's website is awesome. Like, there's all these awesome recipes. Like, all the stuff that you see in that ad, you can learn how to make that stuff on their website, and it is worth it. I mean, the flavor of LS Cream, what it imparts into those drinks, awesome stuff. So, once again, go to creamls.com, slash sifted, buy a bottle or 10. There are store locators there. There's a place where you can go and buy stuff online. Everything you need for the LS Cream experience can be found at creamls.com, slash sifted. And with that... It's time for Game Face proper. We're going to kick things off with, and I realize this is a little bit of a letdown after the game that released last week, but the biggest game release of this week, which is a game called Atlas Fallen. Matt, it, it is so unfortunate that this game is releasing. If there was a game that needed to have its release date moved, this is probably one of them. Although my guess where is... Else, where else do you go unless you move next year? I mean, you probably could have moved into September. There's a couple windows in there. Mm. But I don't think anybody really knew just how big Baldur's Gate 3 was going to be. And to be fair, these are entirely different games. They're both RPGs. However, Atlas Fallen is an action RPG. And Matt, I will say this. Atlas I've, Fallen is a jank-ass RP, action RPG. It's... I, well, I, I really thought about this one because there was, you know, obviously Baldur's Gate, but there wasn't anything else to look at directly other than Quake 2. And like that was already Game Pass. So I looked at this and I watched some videos and I read. I mean, it's, it just seemed too proto spiders to me. Yeah, it's there. Like to, the, the videos of it look so floaty. So this is developed by Deck Thirteen, um, the the Surge people, right? Yep. And to me, they are kind of the next spiders because this game shows a lot of promise in some areas and a mm. lack of budget. In a lot of other areas. So you're seeing the opening Which cinematic weird, right now. Surge 2 kind of nailed it. most, But yeah. I know the scope of Surge 2 wasn't this. Yeah. They're trying a bigger thing here. Yeah. Well, the game itself, what you actually play, does feel like a big epic experience. However, the production values there are corners cut. So <laughs> You know what that reminds me of in a weird way? Do you remember the game Sacrifice? Matt, I'm the just going to... shiny game? I do, yes. Matt, I'm just going to tell you, what does that remind you of right there? Avatar. Avatar, yeah. This game will remind you of 10 different... <laughs> so, so look at the lower third there. Prince of Dune. Right. Prince of Persia. Dune. Avatar. This game takes things from every kind of big sci-fi property that you can imagine. So it is very derivative, but still weird somehow all on its own. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is the production values in this game expose its budget there are no real cinematics in the game even when you talk to people the camera angles that they choose for it are awkward and you can't move like the camera angles um so like the the storytelling in this is is very as, as far as the vehicles that they use to tell the story is very rudimentary but the gameplay and actually how the game plays it's actually kind of on par with most action rpgs like it's it's rare to run into a game that has some parts of it that are really good and other parts of it that are really low rent, but this is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sneaky. Why? What happened? He says, ugh, spiders. I don't want to see any. I'm off for a shower. But I'm, there are no spiders in the <laughs> game. Spiders is a game developer that makes greed fall. Like, come on. No, spiders damn. is a game developer that is like, we, it's a running joke here on Game Face. I'm surprised he doesn't remember it. We always point to Spiders as that studio that's just right on the verge right of there. making the almost, big hit. They almost are the, the next Bioware. They've been the, almost the next Bioware for like three games yeah. now. Yeah, and this is the new one. Deck 13 is the new Spiders, and that's what we meant. Not that there are actually Spiders. Yeah, Deck 13 is like a, like a one Spiders game behind Spiders. Although there are Spiders in Baldur's Gate 3, and I hate those things. 
Oh yeah, well, those, the, the the void spiders that teleport everywhere. You and teleport. Oh, they're the worst. They're the worst in the, in the tabletop as well. <laughs> they're so terrible. Um, so anyway, this game is like I said, it's kind of a mashup of a lot of different sci-fi properties. But the basic premise of the game is that it's set in this fantasy world that had nearly been destroyed by the sun god, and thus and thus that's why once you get out of the early stages of the game, basically the whole game takes place in a desert. Um, so, and the sun god is called Theos. He, he basically has enslaved humans to mine for this resource called essence um, that grows in the human world. And he is, and right now you're seeing you are a human and you are in one of the mining camps where you're basically just a slave. And you're, it's your job to mine the essence and then give it to Thelos, who uses it for his nefarious means. And obviously the objective of the European game. European action RPGs love starting with this. It always does, kind of. Like, it goes all the way back to Gothic 1, pretty yeah. much. Well, we're going to talk about Gothic 1 in today's episode, oddly enough. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyway, basically, humans have been enslaved by this this guy to mine and transport all the essence in it. It is a very clear parallel to the spice in Dune. <laughs> it's, there's just stuff like this all the way through this game, where it's like, oh, that's like this, and this is like that. It's just almost everything mm -hmm. is borrowed from something else. I mean, to be fair, that's also true of Star Wars. Yeah, but but like, you can put that stuff together in a new way. Yeah, I don't. From what I've seen, doesn't feel like this one's doing no. that. Yeah. <laughs> definitely not. It definitely has not been put together in a new way in Atlas Fallen. That unfortunately, a, that is a very blonde person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is the antagonist throughout the game. He's the one who runs the camp. He's the one who cracks the whip, him and yeah, his henchmen. I, I can tell from the shoulders. Yeah, that's all it takes, yeah. right, is <laughs> big shoulders. Um, so you that's... Here from a Blizzard game to ruin everyone's time. Yeah. So that's the basic premise of the game. You're trying to free humanity from this enslavement to mine this material called essence. Now... The catch is that you also use essence to build yourself. So it's a resource that you collect throughout the game that you use to level up and level up your abilities and level up what you're seeing right here, which is the device that you get very early in the game called the gauntlet. Um, so you end up with the gauntlet and then two weapons that you can carry at any time. So the gauntlet <laughs> does like these special almost oh, no, like... No, I'm, I'm turning into a Darksiders character. Yeah, a little bit. You're right. <laughs> so the gauntlet does like crazy like supernatural attacks where it transforms into like a gigantic hammer and all this crazy stuff. Then you also have two different melee weapons. One is just kind of a traditional sword and that you're seeing right now in this B-roll. And then you eventually get like a whip that you can use that is, is for further... It's not really like projectile combat but it has further reach he really um, just jumps into the form on that one doesn't he yeah and, and then that's some, got some really good athletics for someone who's never swung a magic hammer before yeah and then eventually you also use the whip for aerial combat so as you progress through the game and you increase his abilities you get the ability to double jump and then dash and at first you only have one dash and then you level it up and you have two dashes and then you level it up again and you have three dashes which will basically let you traverse like a mile's worth of terrain and that all ties into the aerial combat that you use with the whip like you use the dash and the whip to stay airborne and keep fighting enemies in the air so there's a nice cross-section of different styles of combat in this game. There's a lot of melee. There's also the aerial stuff. And I'll say this. It doesn't feel amazing, but you don't feel completely detached from the melee. Um, it's not God of War. It's not, like, one of the better ones. And, again, I think a lot of that comes in, comes into the feedback you get from That's some solid force feedback. Pop in. The audio. Yeah, there's the LOD issues in this. Mm. This also, by the way, is only for PC and next-gen so there's really not much of an excuse for there to be things like draw in and LOD and stuff like that. It's like that's the only systems that could run this with this low optimization. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. That's exactly it, Matt. That's exactly where we're. I mean, uh, the publisher makes you put it out when you put it out, but like. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly not done here. Yeah. So this game is an open world action RPG, although the. The open world is kind of split into five different biomes. Now, I did say that most of the game is set in the desert, and that is true, but they do. There are some verdant biomes that you mm. get to like venture into. It's not all just tan and brown. Um, and there are... Um, so, like, Dark this, Souls... This is UE5, huh? Okay. Yeah, this is Unreal Engine 5, wow. yep. It's the worst-looking Unreal Engine 5 game I've ever seen. <laughs> well, there's only been two, so... Really? Fortnite, if you count it. Really? There's only two? This is the first Unreal Engine 5 game released. Really? Yeah. I thought for sure there were others. Nope. 
Dang. Unreal Engine 5 has not hit the market. Well, this is not an auspicious start for Unreal Engine 5. <laughs> well, I mean, I think this is more down to who's making it than... Yeah. So the 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 world is open world, and you have... Um... Oh, Remnant 2. Yeah, Remnant 2 was... Unreal okay. 5. Again, that... Be, that... I don't think we're seeing the full extent of no. the engine on these two games. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, uh, what was I getting at? Also, oh, it's an open world game, and you can go anywhere. And there are these things called anvils that are located all around the world. And they're basically the fast travel points. But they also kind of act like the bonfires from Dark Souls. You can do a ton of different stuff at the anvils. You can upgrade the gauntlet. You can upgrade your armor. And armor in this, you don't buy separate pieces. It's just all one outfit. So you get a whole outfit, and you can level up that outfit until you get another one, then you can start leveling up that whole outfit. You don't have, like, separate pieces like a helm and a chest piece and all that kind of stuff. They kind of simplify that part of it. Then you can also... <laughs> oh, Surf Spider knows the Layers of Fear remakes were also unrelated. Oh, that's, that, actually, that's right. Yeah, so there was a few. Yeah, we're... But not many. We're still not really warming up to the full no. potential of the engine quite <laughs> Definitely yet. Definitely not. And you can also upgrade the momentum gauge. And momentum is a really important part of this game because while the, the melee doesn't feel as good as a game like God of War, it actually is deeper than games like God of War. So I already talked about how you have the aerial stuff, you have the melee stuff on the ground. But another big component of this is momentum. If you can keep doling out damage without taking any damage, it starts unlocking these abilities that you can use. So you, you're almost like um, in combat in this, you're like a snowball rolling downhill. The more, the better you are at combat. <laughs> for that comment. Yeah. <laughs> the better you are at combat, the more potent your attacks become. Mm -hmm. So you're incentivized to play a little defensively and be smart. And not it's not that it's hard like Dark Souls where you get hit twice and you die. It's that you just don't want to get hit at all because, it, again, you become this snowball, this unstoppable like creature that they can't stop so well i hope your hitboxes are pristine if that's the engine uh, that's the system you're putting in place they i bet they're not so the enemy hitboxes are okay however your hitboxes though that's the problem for that like whether you're landing your strikes or not no whether you're getting hit properly oh uh, no that's they're pretty accurate like i think that part's good um but the problem is is like the hitboxes in the terrain are not 100 percent and again that's a lack of a budget you just didn't have enough people to go through and scour the entire world to make sure like all the time in this game you're like sinking up to your knees or up to your hips in the geometry like your character will just go below the geometry and it's not snow and it's not sand it's like solid ground and your cre your character will sink down into the ground that happens all the time in this game again kind of shows off that it doesn't have the biggest budget um so yeah, the combat is deep, but it does feel a little bit disconnected. But again, it shows that like with a little bit of tweaks, like you could get it to a good place where the combat in this would be really good. Now you're seeing one of the other abilities you get. You get the ability to raise stuff up out of the ground. And a lot of the times, like the anvils that you can use to save and fast travel and level up, they're not above ground. You have to find like these sparkling things coming up from the ground. And then you use your raise ability to raise it up out of the ground. The same thing happens for chess. The same thing happens like what you just saw right there for um, like platforms that you need to help mm -hmm. platforming. Platforming is a big part of this game, by the way. Um, like th intense 3D platforming, a la like Tears of the Kingdom, like where you're like jumping like 300 yards across these huge gaps. Like that's the type of platforming that's in this game. Also, there's a lot of adventuring to be done because the waypoints in this game, they're good like 60% of the time. The other 40%, they just give you a generally vague idea of where you're supposed to go. And then you have to figure out like the level design, like how to get there. And that to me became really frustrating. In fact, that is what ultimately stopped me playing was I got to a point where I could not, I knew what I needed to do. I could not figure out how to get to the waypoint and I quit. So I've played this around, I don't know, probably 12 hours, something like that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, it feels like it's kind of starting to wrap up already. The pacing of this game, I also love. So it has like, all the abilities and the stuff to level up that you would expect in other RPGs that drag it out for like 60 hours. This truncates like things. So it has the same amount of stuff, but it only takes like 10 hours to unlock it instead of like 50 or 60 hours. So this game is very, very well paced. 15 to 20 hours is time to beat. There you go. I, you can tell. Like when you start seeing that like, oh, I have all the abilities, but two, and I've leveled this up all the way, and now I only have like 30% left on this other thing to level up. I could tell it was starting to wrap up. So 
This isn't one of those gigantic sprawling action RPGs where you start playing it and like you give up before you ever get to the end of it. Most people who take on this game, I think, will finish it because it is good enough to get you through that 15 to 20 hours, ultimately. Um, let's see. What else I got to say about this? Um, so as far as like the leveling up and stuff, you don't do all of that at the... Um, at the anvils, you can just tap like the, the touchpad on the PlayStation controller, and it'll bring up menus where you can do all this stuff. And so, as I said earlier, you're mining essence for this horrible god or whatever, but you also use essence yourself to level yourself up. And there's this entire crazy essence stone system where you have like three tiers and you unlock these little icons. A lot of the chests that you open up in this game, you get like these little like tablets that you use to install into the essence stone system. And you can fuse them together and get crazy combinations. That system's crazy deep. In fact, all the leveling in this is almost too much. Particularly, again, because they're squeezing it all into this very short runtime for this game. It's like you're, they're always introducing something new to you in this, which I think is good, honestly. Um, but yeah, there's the big essence stone system. There's three tiers of that. There's three to four stones for each of the tiers. Um, and then there's 12 essence stones total to unlock for each of those tiers. So again, a lot of the adventuring that you're doing, unlocking chests and stuff, that's where you find that stuff. Um, as I said, the armor comes in full suits and you can upgrade the whole thing at once. Um, the gauntlet you can also upgrade by placing essence stones into the gauntlet. Um, I already talked about the main and the secondary weapons. I talked about the momentum already. Um, the traversal, again, there's a lot of platforming in this. I found it to be mostly solid, but, like, you don't... There's no climbing in this. Like, if you go to jump for a ledge and you just barely miss it, he'll latch onto the ledge and pull himself up. But as far as, like, clamoring over lots of geometry, like, that doesn't work. You're trying to basically double jump over everything instead of just climbing up, up it. I mean, I don't find clambering to be particularly engaging, so... Um, well, you know how much I love it in uh, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom oh, and Breath yeah. of the Wild. <laughs> but there's no stamina meter in this, so they could have put climbing in it, and it wouldn't have been quite as annoying, but they didn't. They do give you a very generous double jump to help get you over most of the geometry anyway. Um, there's tons of quests, my, but one of my big complaints about this is that the quests aren't all that interesting. And again, this is one of those cases where coming off of Baldur's Gate 3 or having, playing, having been playing Baldur's Gate 3 at the same time, it makes this game look bad. So I felt a little bit of the developers talking about how Baldur's Gate 3 is going to make their games look bad. Because that was another big story this entire mm -hmm. week was how developers of big AAA games are complaining that they'll never be able to make a game as good as Baldur's Gate 3. If you're a I mean, little just, guy... I mean, just don't put dice rolls in for everything yeah. <laughs> and you've already got it from me. But. So if you're a little guy trying to make games like this, like it, it's got to be frustrating. And I really oh, saw sure. it firsthand. And to, But to be fair, I mean, Baldur's Gate... That was a six, seven year project right. by a known developer with a almost unlimited budget because of a worldwide famous IP. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously people are not going to be fair and they're going to compare, you know, these other games to that. But like, mm -hmm. you can't judge your own work by in comparison yeah. to that unless unless you are also playing, you know, in that same pond. Like that, like the Halo guys need to judge themselves by that. Yeah, yeah. But like, I don't think people making something like this need to need to think that like, but look as a critic it did raise my expectations for what's possible in a game and then i go to this and literally half of the quests in this are just fetch quests go right. here and get this and bring this back hey, and, it's not like it's not like they knew <laughs> ahead of time i mean i guess you could because you had early access but that's you know, Baldur's gate cannot be the new bar no i get that it just still showed how far below the bar this game is as far as its mm -hmm. questing is concerned I've, I maybe, I mean, hell, make Witcher 3 the bar, and it's still short. Yeah. You know, and yeah. That's, no, that, I hear that game's well I hear I'm just saying, having played Baldur's Gate 3 and then mm -hmm. going to this game was like, damn. <laughs> like, there's a huge difference between these two games. Mm -hmm. And most of the quests in this are fetch quests, where you have to go and get something and bring it back to somebody yeah. or but find... there's no place to put this game that that doesn't... I mean, if you put it... You know, assuming Starfield is good, you put this in September, you're like, oh, this open world isn't nearly as impressive as what Starfield lets you explore. Yeah. Like, it's just, you know... That's one of the reasons the B-list game doesn't exist anymore. You know, yeah. like no one has the, the patience for that. I'm like, neither did I. I didn't even buy this game. This is the kind of thing that I would enjoy normally. You know, yeah. like, I don't mind a little bit of jank, and I like kind of a new idea and a action RPG thing. I usually like kind of that weird European sensibility of mashing yeah. a bunch of random shit together and calling <laughs> it a, a new fictional world, you know, that kind of thing. And I probably would buy this, like, if it drops to, like, 30 once the dust has settled on this year's release schedule. But it's like... 
Yeah, it's just a. It's just a. I'm sorry, guys. It's just a bad situation to put. Yeah, put the this timing's game in. bad, but it does do some things otherwise that like other games don't do. For example, um, there's this mechanic. So there's you can roll away and parry that way, but you can also block with L1, and you basically you get this like skin on your body. They call it sand skin or whatever. And if an enemy attacks you while you're in sand skin, it freezes them. And then you can jump in and just pile on the damage. It's Mm. against like the mini bosses and stuff like that. It's invaluable. It reminds me of something, but I can't remember what. I don't know. It hasn't reminded me of anything. I don't remember any game that That rings a bell for something. I can't remember what it is. Whatever it is, it's old enough that it does. It probably still counts as innovation here. Yeah. So they do that. And that's something that I haven't seen in other games. And it's fun. And it's a good way for to manage crowd control. Because you can even if you if you freeze an enemy and you don't attack them immediately, they're still frozen, which means you can focus on some of the other enemies because you do get bombarded at times in this game by like five or six enemies that are like attacking you off a screen and stuff like that. It took me a few hours to kind of get a handle on how the flow of the game would work once combat kind of kicked off. Um, and so, look, it does do some things that are different from other action RPGs, and we should definitely give games credit when they do that. But ultimately like again the production values like the storytelling stuff like that is way below the bar and i think that's what will turn people off in this game more than anything else now you're looking at the essence stones this is like the upgrade system that you can use for your gauntlet that assigns they're basically just buffs that you can assign so you can see there's eight eleven that you can I have i can't help but notice you're fighting those same lava dogs a whole lot well this b-roll is from the first hour of the game mm-hmm. and that's the way our b-roll always is so i yeah. didn't i didn't go back after i played but more. usually there's more enemy variety even the early Early parts of some that's, of these games. That's true. And but I will say this: the enemy variety does. It's not bad. It's not something mm-hmm. that stood out to me. Some of them are annoying. Like there's these sandworms that come out from under the ground, and like you have to fight them a lot, and they are really freaking annoying, unfortunately. But for so the most part, you're gonna rip off Dune. You better make the sandworms dangerous. Yeah. Another issue I found with this is, like I said earlier, there's a lot of platforming in this, and not just platforming where you're like, okay, I can see where I need to go. It's just a matter of me being good enough to get there. A lot of it is like, how the hell do I get there? How do I find this little like pathway on the side that gets me back in there where the waypoint is? And the camera in this is not great as far as like what you can control. It doesn't let you tip up high enough. It's almost like Baldur's Gate 3, actually, mm. if you play with a controller. It doesn't let you kick the camera up enough to see high enough because there's a lot of verticality in this game where you're climbing up these crazy towers trying to find this one thing that you can jump off of to get to this. It's a, again, it's a lot like... Um, Tears of the Kingdom, when you're up in the sky after you've learned the bird ability where you can like jump really far, a lot of the platforming in this is very similar to that. And the camera is not good enough at certain points. Like there's times where I would climb all the way to top of something. I'd be like, oh, I can't get any higher. I jump down and then I'd look up and I'd be like, oh, there was a freaking ramp right up there. And now I have to climb all the way back up the damn thing again because the camera could not show me that there was the ramp up there that I needed to use. So there's little things like that that happen. Um, Creatures come up from the ground in this, so it's also one of these games where it's hard to manage, like, whether you want, if you want, if you don't want to fight, it's almost impossible to avoid. They're random encounters, basically, because you're just walking along, and next thing you know, up pops a bunch of enemies out of the sand, and you gotta fight them. Um, Also, another innovative thing about this game that you've seen throughout the B-roll is the sand surfing. It may seem, like, cool, and it is, it's like snowboarding, basically, um, and you can only do it on the sand and like the transition, like if you're sand surfing and you come across a piece of solid dirt, like you'll, you'll transition out of it and kind of do a quick run to like catch your legs or whatever. Um, but it also plays into the combo. So if you're sand surfing and then you jump out of a sand surf, that opens up a whole other area of combat. So again, like the combat in this is pretty good. But the other thing that sand surfing does... That feels like it comes out of Breath of the Wild. A little bit, yeah. But the other thing that the sand surfing does is that it keeps you from having to have a mount. Hmm. You don't need a mount in this game because you can sand surf really fast. And it gets you from point A to point B as quickly as you need to get there. And if that's not quick enough, you can just use one of the anvils to fast travel. So honestly, like there's not a lot of like annoyances about this game. Like they've managed to like the, the ease of use is pretty damn good. It is shorter. And I think that had to do with the budget or whatever, but based upon what I played so far, like if it ends in five hours, I'm cool. Like if I had paid 60 bucks for this game, I would be okay with that. So this was actually kind of another pleasant surprise for me. The production values, huge letdown, huge disappointment, definitely the weakest part of the game. But the other parts of it, like, they're kind of there. Like, 
again, they're like the next spiders. They just need to take a couple more steps to just to just get to that triple A big budget status. And maybe the publishers just need to give them a little bit more money so that they can make these things happen. There's a lot of voice acting in the game, so they did shell out the money for that, but the voice acting isn't great, so you get what you pay for in a lot of cases. Um, and the story isn't great, and the storytelling isn't great, but when you're actually playing the game, it looks good, it plays good, the combat for the most part feels good, it's deep, you can play it the way you want. If you're more into like aerial stuff, you can do it. If you're more into like projectile stuff, you can do it. If you like melee stuff, you can do it. Um, I thought the timing and the response and the controls were pretty good. Uh, so overall, I was pleasantly surprised by this game. Um, but again, it's coming in such a tough time that it's, it's almost impossible to recommend. Like, you got Starfield coming in two weeks, which is an action RPG. Mm-hmm. So it's like, even if I could recommend this over Baldur's Gate because Baldur's Gate is a turn-based RPG, you have Starfield coming in two weeks. It does no way. Immortals of whatever. Avium is. coming at the end of the month, which, like next week. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, I'm not particularly interested in that game, but it looks certainly more polished, lively, and, and polished in yeah. terms of a new world than this does. Although it looks like its story also sucks, but <laughs> I mean, see. I could have told you that from the first trailer, yeah. but like, we'll yeah. see. Yep, but I had a good time with this. Again, I played it for around 11 or 12 hours, and if it is indeed just five or six hours longer, like, you know, will I go back and finish it off? Probably not, because I just need, I need to jump on Madden now. I need to jump on Immortals of Avium now. I may have to jump on Starfield now, depending on what Bethesda says when they get back to us. So it'll be hard for me to go back and finish this, but I really enjoyed the 11 or 12 hours that I played it. Um, this is one of those games, maybe, if you see it on down the road for 20, 25 bucks, um, just maybe make a mental bookmark and say, you know, if I see this later on for cheaper, it might be worth playing. Oh, I should also mention, it's cooperative as well. Uh, it's only co-op for two players, though. So it's you and one other person. And the drop-in and drop-out is great. You can just leave it open and let people join as you want to. Uh, the interface to invite people on your friends list into the game is very simple and intuitive and easy to use. I also was surprised to see that there was like six or seven people on my friends list that are playing this game. Like, mm. I was surprised to see that. Um, in fact, some of y'all who are on our chat pretty frequently, I saw that some of you guys were playing this. So um, I had fun with it. A couple of them did not like it. Oh, really? Yeah. Who? Well, Digital Reflux doesn't like I it. I find it very boring. Interesting. I wonder what he found boring about it, other than the story. Um, Toast9, thank you for Twitch Prime, by the way. Um, AJ the Legend of Watson asks, will this get a sequel? I mean, that all depends on sales. Mm. And based upon the time that it's coming out, probably not. Yep. Um, Erebus Jones says it looks generic. I don't think it looks generic. I just think it looks derivative, meaning it looks like a bunch. They took bits and pieces from a bunch of other stuff and made it into their own whole. Um, that, but I don't think it looks generic. Like I don't. Can you think of another game that takes place in like a sand environment like that? I mean, it looks like a bunch of different things mashed together. It looks like Journey plus mm-hmm. Prince of Persia Journey's the plus obvious Avatar analog. There. Plus, I mean, yeah, yeah it's. Yep. Um, they're also saying Redfall was Unreal Engine 5, but I didn't think that was the case. Johnny Hurricane, thank you for Twitch Prime. I hope you're doing good, man. Uh, the Big Smoke 82, thank you for Twitch Prime. You guys jump, getting in in the middle of our discussions here. So anyway, it looks like everything everyone had to say about that. So, um, MHG and Morton Joe says it reminds me of B-tier stuff like Metal Arms or Biomutant. That's a pretty good comparison. Like, yeah. You, you get the same corners cut in this game generally like the presentation the cinematics things like that aren't quite as elaborate aren't done quite as well but the actual core gameplay and the actual playing of the game is kind of up to scratch that's the best way i could describe Mm. atlas fallen um again it's only for a pc and next gen so if you have old consoles you can't even think about playing it Um, but again it's a shame to me it's a shame that this is going to get lost in the mosh so to speak um it it's going to ultimately deserve better than it's going to get i think i can safely say at this point because it's just again released at a poor time and that was focus interactive's fault you know they're the publisher of the game like they should have looked at the schedule and been like you know we could probably find a better week for this game than smashed in between two gigantic rpgs that everyone is going to buy Uh, but anyway that's atlas fallen again it's available for pc playstation 5 and xbox series x next up we're going to talk about thq which was the last to do its not E3 press event mm. for 2023. It had it this week, the, TH, the THQ Nordic Showcase for 2023. Um, and as it turns out, it actually had a good bit of stuff to show. However, the lower third says it all. Remember me? Because almost all of THQ Nordic's games are old IP 
that you may or may not remember. I mean, that is all their IP. That is, I mean, that is THQ Nordic in a nutshell because it went on, Embracer went on this IP buying spree. We talked about it a couple weeks ago on Game Face. We showed you all the IP it owns and it's all like B, B plus tier properties basically. And that's pretty much what this showcase was. A collection of B tier IP minus maybe one or two um, that you may remember and say, hey, I think I kind of like that. (laughs) Like, that to me was the showcase in a nutshell. However, they did show a bunch of games. We're going to go through, like, the four or five biggest ones that they showed. I think the one for most people that they're going to care about is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin. This is based on a comic book miniseries from mm-hmm. years and years ago. Well, a few years ago. Only a few years ago? Yeah, it was the last... Within the last five years. Oh, okay. I actually thought it was farther back than that. No, this is the basically the end of the... IDW TMNT timeline. Okay. And what you're seeing here are these candles being extinguished because the comic book is about the last turtle. Mm-hmm. There's only one of them left. Have they all been killed or have yeah. they they've all been They're killed? They're all dead except this one. And the the, prem, the because in the the it basically jumps to the end of like years in the future of the what the current timeline was and you don't know who the living turtle is. Thus this yeah. secretive so because the, the the last ronin turtle uh, has all four of the colored headbands hanging from his belt and wears a red like a black he was a black headband mm-hmm. um in like in basically in honor of his brothers and so it's several issues before you realize who he is and he mm. fights with all of their weapons do you do you know already who it is i do know who it okay. is. okay we won't spoil it here um and if you've read if you're reading the main idw series it makes a lot of sense who it is um, they did plant the seeds of who that would be. Okay. Um, Here's the only video gamey shot from yeah, the whole basically trailer. Basically, it's um, Shredder and the, and basically everybody they lose. Is, is the, the turtles idea. lose? The turtles lose. Yeah. Their allies lose. Krang and the and Shredder and all the all the enemies of the turtles win. And they he is it's like a post apocalyptic version of New York. And he goes out and does what he can to try and fight back. Um, and it's a it's a very bleak and very bitter story. dark yeah. right yeah I mean I think I feel like all of us have been waiting on this type of a game from this IP for a while yeah well especially since that's what um, that's what it started I mean, in general yeah. started as a more or less a parody that became a genuine imitation of the Frank Miller Daredevil comics from the yeah. early eighties which were very dark and gritty and I mean they are. They were created by the same uh, canister of radiated radioactive goo that created Daredevil. Right. In the in the comic, he pushes an old man out of the way of a truck, and, the, and a canister falls off the truck, goes hits him the, near yeah. the eyes, yeah. and he loses his sight but gains his radar powers. In the tra- in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that canister bounces off his head, rolls goes into, into the sewer, the sewer yeah. and gets gets on the turtles and the rat that becomes Splinter. And the rest is history. And, yeah, and that's why Splinter's name is Splinter because uh, Daredevil's mentor is named Stick. Ah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. That's why the Foot Clan is the Foot Clan, because Daredevil fights the hand. Ah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You learn something every episode of Game Face, I so, guarantee um, it. So, yeah, <laughs> this, is something. Very, this is very much... In, but some people are like, oh, my God, this is so not what the Ninja... Like, no, this is, is exactly what the Ninja yeah, Turtles are We were are waiting about. for this. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Um, it's coming in 2024. It's only announced for PC and Next Gen. We do not have a solid release date for 2024. Not even a quarter yet. But, as you can tell from that trailer, all they had was that still that was just kind of mm-hmm. like art to try to get the gist of what the game's yeah, going to look it's like it's a ways out yeah but uh i do if you i do recommend the the comic series if you pick i think it's five issues okay um but it's, a, it's a very good story even if you don't really know the current the idw continuity which is over because idw is shutting down in like january february yeah but uh no it's it was very good much more to come on this game very soon next up a new south park game called south park snow day matt i i gotta say I'm pretty excited to get a South Park game that isn't a turn-based strategy RPG. I'm a little disappointed it doesn't have some, like, rude subtitle. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, because the last couple games did. Um, But to me, I'm glad that there's a South Park game coming that's not what we've been getting from, you know, was it THQ that made the... Yeah, yeah. that was Ubisoft. Ubisoft, Ubisoft yeah, that's right. I think Um, THQ published... Or maybe did THQ handle the first one and then Ubisoft handled the second one, I think. I thought Ubi did both of them. Did it? I might be wrong. Okay. Um, But anyway, this is like a cooperative game that you play with friends where you go out into the snow and you have snowball fights, but it's also extremely gory and bloody. 
I mean, it kind of sounds like the N64 game. A little, a little bit. bit. That was that was a that was a snow. There were snowball fights. There was that. snowball fights in that. It, yeah, it seems like a spiritual successor to the N64 South Park game. But this, you team up with your friends, and I think it's up to four people cooperatively play against. So it's PVE, I guess, is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, you play cooperatively against the computer through a campaign, which I think is probably a good design choice for South Park. Um, because, you know, you want to get all the characters in there. And if you're not going to do a strategy RPG where you use them as units, if you have to select from a screen which character you want to play as, and presumably each of these characters has their own abilities and blah, blah, blah. So um, I'm excited for a new South Park game that isn't the same one we've played for the last 10 years. It is surprising there aren't more South Park games, ultimately. Hmm. Because it's it just seems like a property that's just ripe for video games. Somewhat, but, but I, as far as I know, Trey and Matt are very picky about what games are made with it mm-hmm. because they are game people. So yeah. it doesn't real also doesn't surprise me that like the projects for these are picked and chosen carefully. Yeah. So yep. It does feel like they got they went about as far as they could go with the turn based RPG idea, and also you probably don't want to deal with ubisoft right now anyway because they're having such a hard time getting anything made yeah so yep so anyway that game is also 2024 also pc and next gen also don't have a hard release date for it yet so just stay tuned we're going to get a lot more information on both teenage mutant ninja turtles and south park in the very near future is my guess um next up titan quest 2 so if you this is the interesting one to me yeah so if 150 hours of diablo 4 was enough to burn you out here's another 150 hours of isometric action rpg action um were you a fan of the first titan quest matt oh yeah yeah i like the first one a lot and i was shocked when they made two more expansions when mm-hmm. nordic bought them yeah um it's very good this is a little different this seems like more of an op- open world game whereas kind of like diablo 4 uh, yeah, whereas the first one, the, the first Titan Quest was very much a Diablo 2 mm-hmm. inspired. In fact, I think I had a couple Diablo 2 people on yeah. it. Yeah. But it was a very pretty linear with certain, you know, forked paths, but you were going down the same path through the game. Yeah. Like the whole way. And it's very long. Like if you buy, if you get the, uh, you know, the original Titan Quest with all its expansions now for like $9 or whatever it is in a Steam sale, you're, yeah, 150 hours. Easy. Yeah. They're gigantic games, just like Diablo. And this, we don't have a release date for this yet either, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, it's just 2024, and yeah. it's also PC and next gen. Very, it looks very different. I mean, I do think it, it, like they only have the one picture, like the still frame with a giant, giant enemy crab. Yeah, which is a bold choice. We yeah. all know what the giant enemy <laughs> crab means. Um, presumably, you will flip it over to strike its weak point for, for <laughs> massive, massive damage. damage. <laughs> but um, it does look a little generic in comparison to the art style of the first, but I think it loses, it lost something. It looks a little more like, um, like it looks like just sort of another Grim Dawn Path of Exile sort of clone. Mm-hmm. But it is the Spellforce 3 developers, so there might be something here. Yeah. Like, they get the, the, the people working on it are, are solid. So uh, it def- of all the things they announced, this is the one that had my attention the most. And chances are, by the time this comes out, you will be done with Diablo 4. It'll be done and dusted you'll be ready for another isometric action rpg and this franchise has been great in the past it's kind of like the second fiddle to diablo i would argue i mean i would say that's path of exile you think so um certainly in terms of how many people play it for sure yeah um this one has big potential Mm because it's more of a it's more of a uh like path of exile has a lot more mmo to it and Mm -hmm. this has more i think this more is traditional diablo yeah although we'll see what this one does uh in comparison they didn't show really any gameplay of it this one could definitely go that same path of exile diablo 4 route that does seem to be where the genre is going yeah we'll see yep um also vincent says that press releases say south park is coming to switch too so and not switch to switch as well switch also (laughs) switch also yeah um sneaky ass didn't trey and matt hate making games they didn't hate making the game so much as they just didn't have enough time in their lives to do it because they make those episodes so fast and they're hands-on through the whole thing. So they, having to stop and approve or give input or help write the elements of the games were burdens on their schedule. Um, and then the and so Abr- their decision on that is like, we can't make it... If we can't be involved and be sure we're making something we like, we don't want to do make anything at all because it's not like they need more money. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> so. <laughs> um, the Abram and ETH demons say that... Um, Obsidian made the first South Park right. strategy RPG. Because THQ uh, folded. And then yeah. UB picked it up to publish because THQ folded in the middle right. of development. So and then we, UB themselves made 
uh, the second the one. fractured but whole yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> with that subtitle that you're talking mm-hmm. about uh so anyway there's some clarification on that stuff and again vincent says the south park is coming to switch interesting that it's like pc next gen and switch mm-hmm. good luck with that that's all i gotta say hopefully they can get it to <laughs> they can get it I to mean, run the first one scaled to everything so, yeah that's yeah. true Yep. Just roll the roll that uh, that detail slider down and yeah. <laughs> call the Switch game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, we mentioned this a little earlier in the show. Gothic 1 is being remade. We already knew about this, but we got a new trailer for it. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, to Matt's point earlier, this trailer is all about walking through the camp. Mm-hmm. <laughs> literally. You said that like Gothic 1 is kind of like Gothic 1. I'm like, literally, the trailer we're about to show is exactly what we're watching. All the, that and Risen, you know, they all start with like you're a slave in some camp thing. I think, I think Gothic is literally a mining camp. Yeah, it's a mining camp. Yeah. <laughs> literally the and same risen thing. is also coming back out there's a switch is, version yeah. of that coming i was yeah. like okay we're going back to all the old euro jank uh, rpg i hope they put decent inventory systems in these things for once because these things are unplayable now. i know i mean they were barely playable at the time but well, now also the basic gothic one is coming to switch just the port of the og game oh my god they I just announced even... they just put out a trailer for that like last there week there has or to be some ui tweaks on that because there's no i'm way. sure there will be there's no yeah. way that it's almost you're right now. it's almost unplayable um, so yeah, my recollection of Gothic One, they're not that great. They're they were be- they are beloved games. Yeah, I know people always talk Gothic, about them. Gothic but... Two is much better. Uh, Gothic One, I think, uh, benefits from Gothic Two's reputation. Um, Gothic Three is sort of meh. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the developers of Gothic, because I think the developers of Gothic One and Two moved on to Risen, and Gothic Three was made by different people because of some. You know, licensing, licensing something or other snafu. Yeah. yeah publishing snafu mm-hmm. um but yeah that's sort of where the the modern euro jank rps where we get um you know the, the greed falls and the all that stuff right they, they all have their their roots their roots here um i don't know if bringing them back is particularly needed but uh but this is all thq nordic has this is this is my point the lower third remember me like that's yeah. their entire lineup is like this it's like hey there's this game that some people thought was cool other people don't remember it quite as well but we're gonna make a new one i mean i guess as long as elder scrolls 6 is still years away you might as well throw out your your yeah. fantasy stuff whenever whatever you think might stick yeah um i mean there is there is as someone who played it back in the day and has tried to replay it a couple times and failed um, there is something to to salvage from Gothic One and Two. Like, mm-hmm. like if you can do good modern, re- you know, you don't even have to be a remake, but you got to fix that fucking interface. Yeah. If you make it play uh, an interface inventory wise like a modern game, you got a pretty solid thing here. It's yeah. very they're very hard and unforgiving, and it's like one of those games where it's like, I mean, at least the originals are like. You're gonna die the first rat you try to fight yeah. if you don't like know what you're doing. <laughs> it's I, true. Like, yeah. They are hard as nails. Yeah. Um, and early on, you're like, you're gonna die. Like, you better not touch anything until you get a couple levels up just by doing fetch quests or yep. something. Like, it's a whole thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how it's received or how they how they handle it, how they present it in terms of UI and how it's received. And I mean, odds are it just comes and goes, and no one ever notices. But like, it's it's an interesting choice that we're suddenly getting Gothic and Risen uh back on con- on console on consoles for the first time for these i think yeah. i think the first ones yeah have, i mean the th- risen risen three and gothic three were on consoles but i don't think the early ones ever made it off pc before yeah i don't either i mean they were it was too early i think um and then the gothic one remake is coming to pc ps5 xbox series and switch so that's another one where they're just tacking the switch on there mm. at the end um, and then the final game from thq's 2023 showcase that we want to share with you guys is a game called outcast a new beginning. Now, this is a sequel to a game that is over twenty years old. That most people oh, this game do not this. remember. I do know this game. This game was way ahead of its time. It, back in the day, yeah. And this is like, an open world action adventure. It's not mm-hmm. an action RPG, and it's actually it's not called Outcast Two. It's just called Outcast. They're using the same base name but with a subtitle. But this game kind of caught my eye. This looks like the same game to me. Like they're remaking like the they same game. Remade the original game. Interesting. Because I recognize some of this. Because I have, I did play this game back in the day. I'm, I'm one of the few. And yeah, this looks like the original game remade to me. I Interesting. Might be, I might be wrong. Um, Maybe that's why they dropped the two. Yeah, it's definitely not. I mean, it doesn't look like a sequel to me. Healthy. Yeah. No, that's this looks like a remake to me. Interesting. Okay. Um, but we 
Vincent says it was called Outcast 2 originally. Yeah, it was. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they reverted or something? Because that's the same guy. And I don't think I don't know if you could swim in the original. Hmm. Um, it's definitely the same world. It looks um, pretty damn good, though. No, yeah, it definitely looks way better than the original. There is, there is a remaster <laughs> of the original um, available on the modern consoles and PC. Um, and it's pretty. It is a little janky in terms of interface because it is from like 2002. Nothing was codified yet, mm-hmm. but it is shockingly modern in terms of design and why, and how the open world is presented and the, the quest design and all that. Like it was this this game's ten years ahead of its time when it came out. Yeah, uh, which may which may be one reason it didn't do very well because a it was very hard to explain what it was <laughs> and b. I don't think many co- computers could run it at the time. Yeah. It was a little it was a little bleeding edge. Yeah. Uh, okay, this was not in the original game, so this must be maybe it is a full sequel or something. Yeah. But um Looks pretty damn good though. No, go check it. I mean, you can get it for pretty cheap on like GOG at the very least. I ch- check this thing out. It's 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 bizarrely modern for some in, outside of the UI. It's biz- like the way it's presented is shockingly I remember, I remember that palace too. That's that, these are, there's a lot, they're revisiting a lot of places from the first game at the very least. Um, so that's coming to PC and next gen, no Switch and no date either. We have no idea when that's coming out. So that's it. That's for the big. That's the big stuff that was at THQ's uh, presentation. What would you give it a, for a letter grade, Matt? Oh, I don't know. I didn't even watch it. Oh, you never watched it. I watched the trailers and the stuff that came out of it after. Well, based on the fact that these are the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it was like a C minus. Yeah, that's that's about. Like right. I did watch it, and that's about right. <laughs> I'm interested in like Outcast and Titan, Titan Quest for sure. And I mean, mine is gothic. Points are. I mean, I'm interested are, in all the games we talked about. I mean, I'll try if if they have revamped the interface on Gothic, I'll try it because yeah. I would love to play Gothic again without screaming at the inventory system every five minutes because mm-hmm. it's fucking go- to pick up something in that game. I remember you had to you had to target it and then highlight it with a button press and then press a different button to pick it up and then press a different button to put it in your inventory (laughs) and then your inventory opening button was different from the equipment opening button and you couldn't have both open at the same time it was mind shredding it was like it was like the original (laughs) i didn't remember that about it it was like the original hitman if you ever, if, I don't know if you played Hitman yeah, one was, recently, <laughs> but oh my god, yeah. it's like one of those things. Like, okay, I recognize that we did not have a codified basic way of picking things up and putting them in inventory and working with them, but this is what you came up with. I like, mean, Red Dead Redemption Two is a little bit that a little way bit, too. Yeah, where you're just but like, it's like <laughs> it's just things where it's like, dude, Diablo existed when you yeah. made this game. No excuse. Just use that. Yeah. Just click the thing, pick it up. It's in the grid inventory. I can put it on my character. You're done. Like, why yeah. is that not just standard? Flush your pride. Make your game better. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Gothic 2 did not have that to be. I mean, the, all the interfaces for the Gothic games are pretty stupid. But, like, until 3, which played, like, a normal game, more or less. Yeah. Gothic 1 and 2 were sort of, like, you need, like, to watch a tutorial video to play the originals. Like, to understand how they work. Because otherwise, you're going to stand there and be like, I don't understand how to swing my sword. Yeah. Or any of that. It's It's bizarre. I mean, maybe I should look at it like this is THQ Nordic <laughs> and like put them in their own class because they really they just own a bunch of old IP. And I think in that regard, like they did a pretty good job with the IP that they have as far as this presentation is concerned. Yeah. So, I mean, they're working with what they got. Yeah. And they're probably picking the cream of that crop when you mm-hmm. really look at the whole list. Sadly. So. <laughs> yep. So there you go. That's THQ Nordic's 2023 showcase. I think. Do you think Outcast has a has potential in terms of breakout? Like that's the yeah. closest thing they have. It looks great, especially yeah. like if you're interested in like like Beyond Good and Evil two, and you are acknowledging to yourself quietly that that's never <laughs> never going to come, come out. out. <laughs> Outcast. This Outcast game might be your yeah. your ticket. Like it's, it's got that same sort of like weird French space opera. Yeah. John Carter same of vibe bat shit it. Mars yeah. sort of like <laughs> element to it. Yep. So there you go. That's THQ's 2023 showcase. Next up, we're going to talk about a game that was difficult to play this mm-hmm. week. Um, both Matt and I got review code of Texas Chainsaw. Actually, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The game. <laughs> the game, <laughs> right, actually. Um, and it was hard to play because you only had journalists on playing. Mm-hmm. And Matt, you said that you tried to join and you sat through a bunch of lobbies yeah, and never got to play. Yeah, I sat through a bunch of lobbies, like an hour, didn't get anything. And then I did it, tried again last night, still nothing. Although... Every time I've been on, it's been the same two other people. <laughs> really? Like one guy, is, guy um, B, C, CBF something, and like I can't remember. The, it maybe doesn't it was, matter. Maybe it was like Cybertron or something. Yeah. Cyber something. And then like the other guy was like big, 
Big Chief Steve or something <laughs> like that, or Big Prince Steve or oh. something like that. And it was me and and the the, the cyber guy or the family and the and Big Big Prince Steve was the the <laughs> follower the, the victim guy. And every time Big Prince Steve would turn his his chat on the voice chat on and be like, "Don't go anywhere." There's like ten more people coming in. We're going. Don't go. Everybody, when you get in the game, just stay there. There's ten more people coming in. There's gonna be like more people coming in. Be all right. Don't, don't leave the game. Don't leave the game. And like, of course, they it, never would, it would go. To, you know, no one ever showed up. And it would switch to the game. And of course, we wouldn't leave the game. It would just boot you back to the menu and say, not enough people to play a game. Try again. And so we yeah. tried again by being in the same room, same with the three same people. two other guys. And this is like. And I did that for an hour. And like every time, it's like, stay in the game. More people show up. No, they don't. They never did. This is the seventh time we've tried it. It's five minutes every time I give up. Like, yeah. So, I, I was luckier. So so I, I watched all the tutorial videos, oh, okay. which explain how everything works and how the game works. And I feel like I have a handle on it, even yeah. though I didn't get to actually play it. But I'll bet you don't. Because <laughs> 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 I actually was lucky. And the, what how it worked for me was... I would have to wait like you for a long time to get a game. But then once you would get a game, you would just keep playing with those same people over and over and over again. So I got to play as much as I wanted to, honestly. And the first thing I will say about this game is the learning curve is like, but mm -hmm. like it is way high. So much so that like my first three games, people just yelled at me yeah. like the whole time. Well, I don't like, know if you looked at the tutorial section. I didn't. You there's a there's one a, a list of they're all videos there's mm -hmm. a list of tutorial videos for the family and a list of tutorial videos for the victims i'm not kidding it took me an hour and 20 minutes to watch them all there i believe it there are 30 20 or 30 per side yeah. like there's a lot happening in this game and this is a blessing and a curse so this is an asymmetrical multiplayer game you may have already gathered that from what matt was talking mm -hmm. about about the victims of by and the family so you play as four victims or you play as three family members and you start out the game, you're a victim and you're hanging in the basement. The first thing you need to do is escape being tied up. And then once you do that, you need to get out of the house and there's eight different maps or whatever, but they all kind of start the same. You're in a, ba a dark mm -hmm. basement. You can hardly see anything. You don't know the, the layout of the basement at all. And your objective is to just get out of the house. But it's so much more complicated than that because... So if you're playing as the family, and I don't know how much you know about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but that's what it's all about. It's about this psychotic family that lives out in the middle of nowhere in Texas, and they make barbecue, and they make barbecue out of humans. So, mm -hmm. um, Or as they call it, their way of life. Right. And so basically, if you haven't watched any of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies... Are some of these characters movies, from other Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies? Yeah. I've They're not seen, all from I've the only first seen one. the first one. Yeah. In the first one, you have... You have Leatherface. Leatherface. You have the the, the dad, who's like grandpa. the smart one. Oh, yeah. The, the He's cook, like the coordinator. He's called the cook in, in this. this. One, yeah. You have Grandpa. Yeah. And then you have... Is the Hitchhiker in the first one? It looked like, the hitchhiker looked like that other he's guy. He's the other the guy. Yeah, because yeah. he's the guy, that, the bait, who would go out on the road and pick right. up the people and bring them back to the Him house. Him or Johnny. Johnny's the good-looking guy who's supposed to be the Johnny lure. was in the later ones, I think. Okay, Johnny in the game is the good-looking one who lures... Is, the bait. Says they lure people in. Yeah. And, kid, and that's how he, they bring them back to the house. Yep. And so you begin every match down in the basement, but the way it works is that Grandpa... If you haven't seen the movie, you wouldn't know this, but Grandpa in the movie, he looked like he was dead. He was this mm -hmm. corpse that would sit in a wheelchair... And you thought for like the whole movie he was just dead. He was just a corpse. And then later on there's a scene. Because it would fit the decor. Right. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then later on there's a scene where they feed him blood and he comes alive. And he's actually alive and he needs human blood to like re reinvigorate. Mm -hmm. And one of the mechanics if you play as the family is you need to go out and get blood and bring it back to grandpa and feed it to grandpa. And when you do that, when he goes up a level, he emits this scream. And it's like sonar going out that will alert the family to where the victims are. And if you're playing as the victim, before Grandpa goes to scream, it will alert you. It'll be, Grandpa's about to scream, hold still. So you have to just stop and wait. And if you don't, it will ping the other parts of the family to come and look for you. But that's not the only way that it pings. If you touch anything... It makes noise, and that will alert them and tell them where you are. So there's this meter in the game where you tap, you hit X, and it feels like an internal meter that you need to get all the way to, to the end to actually finish the, the thing that you're doing. But then there's an outside meter that will also, if it goes over the hilt, it will alert the family as well. So really the whole objective of the game is trying to escape this basement and this house without alerting the family. And 
there's a bunch of different things you have to do to do that. You need to find this tool. And when you find the tool, you find a toolbox. But when you're rummaging through the toolbox, you have to play that same mini game with those two, that internal bar and that external bar to not alert people. And it takes forever. It takes like 40 seconds to find like a tool in a toolbox. And then once you find the tool that will actually let you unlock the door, you need to find a clear amount of time to get to the door and then jimmy the door and you have to do that and not make noise and you need to open the door and not make noise there are in every doorway there's like bones hanging down if you brush against those that alerts the family but you can find bone fragments that you can use to affix to the bones hanging in the in the doorway and that will keep them from making sound and it's that's like how the game works and i would just say that it feels almost impossible to survive mm-hmm. it I'll, the other thing i'll say about it too is playing this game made me feel like how it must feel to be in the movies. Like, because you're trying to do this thing, it's taking forever, and they're bearing down on you. I'll say this. <laughs> the first four games of this, I literally thought my heart was going to pound out of my chest. I was that scared and that, like, flustered playing this. Now, as you play, it's like anything. Eventually, like, the whole newness of it wears off, and, like... By the time I got to, like, my fifth game, I still got excited when Leatherface was chasing me around, but I wasn't literally, like, thought I think I was going to have a heart attack. My first few games, literally, I was like, I might die playing this. My heart was pounding so hard because... So eventually you're going to get discovered because it's impossible to stay quiet. And once that happens, the family starts coming for you. And each one of them is different. Like the older guy, he just has like a like a switch blade or whatever. And then like the girl has like a, a shaving blade. But obviously Leatherface has a freaking chainsaw and he starts chasing you around. And you hear that like you're so you're fiddling with stuff. You're trying to get the something out of the toolbox. You hear the chainsaw like really low. You're like, OK. He's coming. You keep fiddling with it. It gets louder and louder and louder until it's like, whoa, wah, and you turn around and right there and you just run. And that is when it just becomes terrifying. So you have advantages when you're running. Like there's these areas inside the house that you like can shimmy through and slide through. And if you do that, you can do that faster than the family because they're insane and they can't figure out simple shit like how to shimmy through a freaking wall. A couple of them can do it. They do it, but it takes them a while because they're literally... Like Leatherface meant, can't get through that stuff. He, he can bust it down. He just saw through it. He's yeah. So Leatherface, every match has to have Leatherface. Mm-hmm. He, every, you, won't, you can't start a match until someone chooses Leatherface because he's the only part one in the family who can bust down barriers and like cut through doors. Otherwise, like the rest of the family wouldn't be able to get to you if you didn't have Leatherface. So he's a requirement for every match. But these people are insane. Like, if you ever watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, they're so crazy, like, they can't run in a straight line. Like, they run zigzag. Like, they're just, they're insane. And you use that to your advantage in this game. They can't shimmy through walls as fast as you can. They can't climb over stuff because they have to stop and think about it before they can do it. And so you use that to your advantage to try to get away. And then you go and hide. You hide in in the shadows. You hide in lockers. There's meat coolers that you hide in. And it's terrifying. Like, you get away from Leatherface, you can't really hear the chainsaw anymore, so you hide. But chances are, you ran through a doorway right before you hid, and so he got that ping, and he knows roughly where you are. And so you're hiding in this locker, and there's always little slots that you can look out through, and you just see Leatherface running back and forth, like, let's get the B-roll going, because there's... I was going to say, is there going to be B-roll? Yeah, there's awesome B-roll for this. Um... And it's terrifying. And as you're sitting in like in a locker or in a meat cooler or whatever, looking out through the slats, like your heart, your heart rate increases. I never managed to hide from Leatherface successfully. He eventually always found me. And when that happens, you have an option where you can burst out of where you're hiding and you get like a few step advantage on Leatherface and you can kind of get away from him again but the cycle repeats and inevitably you need to get out of there so once you've alerted the family like I was saying earlier getting out of there feels almost impossible like there are people so I was starting playing but there were people who are already like level 10 level 15 level 20 or whatever Mm -hmm. who have been playing it for a long time so a lot of times I would die and then I would start watching the other people play. And even the people who had been playing for like, it looked like a week or two weeks couldn't escape. Like there was one time where like this, and you'll see it here in the B-roll, this one player gets all the way out to the final gate, unlocks the final gate and just isn't fast enough to run away and dies. 
Like, yeah, it's funny because like in the tutorial videos, there's a thing where it's telling you as a family all the ways you need to deal with things and what you need to do and defend grandpa and make sure that. And like at one point, it's like when you first start, it may seem impossible to keep up because there's so many, there's more survivors and you ended up, but just keep at it. And you'll be I'm like, I have never played one of these games where I felt I was under equipped as the killers. Yeah. Like that, that, that was a weird thing. I thought. Cause say. Friday the 13th was kind of that way too. It was almost yeah. impossible to escape. Like you had to do the whole thing with the car and the battery mm. and blah, blah, blah. And it's like this convoluted long drawn out per- process. It's like, you can't get and away. Jason could teleport if he got right. the right ability. Yeah. So, I mean, well, I mean, and look, that's, True to theme. Yeah. I mean, it's thematically appropriate. Yeah. He, he did that. He did that, yeah. I mean, there's no, no other way to interpret some of the things he yeah, does. Yeah, he would just appear, yeah. and so he's teleporting. He um, had to be. And now there's more than one. Right. This. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's got a team of three it's, that are all kind of synergizing if they know what they're doing. And they're communicating, and you're communicating too as the victims, by the way. Mm-hmm. And that's a really, that's a deal breaker for this game. If you're not communicating through mics, you have no chance. Um, the communicating through mics is what got me like even out of the basement the first time because they're like, get over here, get over here. We're about to open the door because you need to coordinate stuff. So once you get the tool to unlock the basement door, you want mm-hmm. all the victims together to go through that door at the same time. Right. Because if you don't go through that door with everybody else, you're dead. Oh, and it should be noted that you are slowly dying right. the whole time. Yes. So you're bleeding because they've already like tortured you and like sliced you up. And so you're bleeding throughout the entire thing. And that's how the girl dies at the end of this is she bleeds out and just falls down. So you're constantly bleeding out. You need to find health in the environment as you play it. And you pick up these bottles and you drink them and it staves off dying from blood loss, basically. And you can literally just fall down and die just from bleeding out in this game. So it's that's part of the tension that's always there. The tension of, like, making any mm. noise. The tension once you're you discovered. Leave, if you leave blood behind, like, the, I think it's the... One of them is it Johnny can track you, like can actually like see your like oh, see your blood. style can see like your footprints and the scent you leave behind. Yeah, stuff. I don't know. I never ever won and got out. We died every single time I played this, and I actually saw. I think somebody said something to the developers and was like, "Yo, like no way can ever survive this." And they're like, "You can." Like they put out a, a press release today or a statement today on Twitter or something like saying like, "You just got to stick with it." But that's the problem with this game. The the learning curve of this game is just insane. And if you're playing with people who have already been playing it, they get very frustrated with you very quickly. And I can understand it. Like if I'm running around in the basement and I'm just setting off noises everywhere, Whoops. like Yeah. No, that was another survivor. Here. No, that wasn't. No, that was Sissy. That was okay. Sissy. Yeah. Like, this game, like, I, again, the first handful of games that I played this, I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack playing it. I, my heart was beating so hard that I could, like, see my... <laughs> seriously. Here Hang I just, on, let me get the... No, this is where I just gave on. up. Because already the other people had escaped the basement, and I was like, I can't survive. And I was just like, just kill me. And so I just let him saw me up. <laughs> and I needed it for the Mega B-roll. <laughs> and she runs away. Oh. Well, because she needs to go find the other ones. Like, So once you know he, they catch me, it's not over. Like They have to catch the other three victims as well. They have to stop all four of them from escaping. Um, and uh, so I had a great time playing this game, but it's also supremely frustrating. It's like, even once you get outside, it's like, you'll see here. She has, you have to kick this generator for like 40 seconds to kill the generator. And it's like, it, while you're doing it, it's sending, like, noise signals to the family to come and get you. So you can watch her. Like, whoever plays this character goes and hides in the woods for a while after she unlocks, like, one of the locks. Like, you have to be very strategic in this game. Like, even when you think, oh, I've got it. I'm home free. If you get too hasty and just try to run out, they'll get you. Because, again, like, you run. You don't run faster than the family they can outrun you even if they run in a zigzag they can still run faster than you so you need a huge head start like even once you're outside and you're like okay i'm past the final gate you still need a huge head start to make it out to the highway to save yourself um so i don't know it was very frustrating it was terrifying and frustrating to me but again like to my point earlier like i felt like i was in the movie because it's like in horror movies, it's like everything takes longer than it should. You drop stuff and like you stumble and you fall down. Like this game replicates all of that stuff, all of that frustration that you get watching these movies. Like, well, of course you fell down. Well, in this game, you fall down. <laughs> like right there, right on cue with the B-roll. He bled out and just, he's done. There's nothing you can do. And they, the crazy part is they still let you like massacre them, even though they bled out already. They still show the cinematic. And this, 
I mean, I'll say this as a fan, at least of the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this game does the movie justice. Like, it doesn't really pull any punches. It's got like Like, the kind of the 70s almost grindhouse presentation. Like, it starts with a narration. Yeah. It's very authentic. And it's set in 1973, so it's all. The clothing, it all feels right. Yeah, Yeah. It's, yeah, it's. It's as. It's. In terms of using the license, I don't have any suggestions. Like, yeah. I think they nailed everything. I yeah. mean, the license itself, to your point you are saying earlier, we were talking about, like, who are some of these people? Like, that's the, the truth. Yeah, the like, problem is that you're dealing with what I would consider a B-list slasher movie. Like, after I mean, I, the first I mean, one. I, yeah, I mean, I know Texas Chainsaw Massacre was sort of the first. Yeah. Like, it was, I mean, Halloween codified it, mm-hmm. but Texas Chainsaw Massacre was sort of, like, a big deal in that regard. But it was never really that again. You right, know, it, it was always sort of an also well, ran against the against the Friday the Thirteenth and the Nightmare on Elm Streets and the Halloweens. Well, that's because Texas Chainsaw Massacre Two didn't release until over a decade yeah. after the first movie, and then you're absolutely right; it was a joke. Like it, mm-hmm. it literally was a joke. Like if you watch, it's kind of like Evil Dead Two, where they turned it into like this parody, where it's like mm-hmm. they're going for laughs and yucks and blah blah blah. It wasn't like deathly serious like the first texas chainsaw mm-hmm. massacre was and then the third one went even further that direction Well, because i think they were sort of moving in because you know the yeah the original was a very grindhousey fly oh, by scary night like, af like well i think it's dumb but like it's it's but you're not scared by anything no though. i'm not somehow you not have avoided movies. the scared gene i yeah. don't know how that's possible but but like you know very famously it was you know they used real slaughterhouse like guts to like do the effects mm-hmm. and like you know the, the the girl being hung up on the meat hook by by leatherface still gives me chills like she was basically they were hanging her up by like a nylon and she really did get hurt doing right. that yeah and, like, it was it was very like low budget fly by night almost indie film horror stuff and it had that kind of of cachet at the time it was almost like you were going to you know i mean we weren't around for that but like you know my dad would say like going to see that it felt like going to see something that like you weren't supposed to see right you forbidden know, it was a forbidden yeah. like, thing um but by the time they made the second one like slasher movies were a big were big yeah, business they and they were huge, a big deal yeah. and you know if if you went to see a friday the 13th movie or something or a halloween movie in the theater you'd see that a lot of the people were laughing right like a lot of people really found it entertaining from a in a funny way or whatever yeah. so i can see why you lean into that with texas 2 in the sense of like oh well if people are entertained by this in that way let's like lean into that and do it because there was also like return of the living dead did that yeah evil dead there was it there was, was weird a, for texas chainsaw but this, is, this is a very weird because even the people it's like either people don't know what you are or they do remember what you are and they are not expecting that yeah from the, so yeah texas 2 was was is one of the weirdest choices in sequels well the whole thing is set in like an Halloween amusement 3. park and like it, it just yeah. it, it just didn't make compute it didn't compute as no. someone who was a big fan of the first movie i was like what the hell is well, and also this? one of the things that made the first movie work is how weird everything is how there's no explanations for anything yeah like, what are these no you, what the fuck is grandpa like there's not the end of the movie is just leatherface squealing in the middle of the road screaming like you yeah. never find out anything about this no nope. it's just like if you take the wrong turn down the wrong road you might end up You're in this fucking, this situation. <laughs> yeah. you know? and like expanding that and building that and adding new family members and t- like that was always a mistake yeah like there's you know you can't there's no mythology there's no way to expand that quote-unquote mythology without ruining what made the first one so effective and this is the mini game i was talking about where you're trying to keep quiet mm-hmm. while you're doing stuff and it takes and the, for flipping ever and the funny thing is that leatherface has a similar mini game to run his chainsaw he does yeah so like because the chainsaw you have to start the chainsaw up mm-hmm. and then you have to keep the chainsaw revved yeah otherwise you can't use it, it shuts down it. yeah but you can do like a super like one hit kill with it if you rev it way up almost till it overheats and attack before it overheats but if it does overheat you got to start the whole mini game over he misses a lot too like yeah. that's what made me start to lose a little bit of the tension as i kept playing it was like realizing that just because he gets right next to me doesn't mean that he's gonna kill me yeah there's there's there, you're balancing from what i could see in the tutorials you're balancing at least three buttons with with him making yeah. the chainsaw work. You're yep. you're you're pressing. I think it's R B to start the chainsaw, and you're hitting X to start it up, and then you have to keep revving it with left trigger, and then you attack with right trigger, and you're still moving him around and trying to target the end the, the the victim. Yeah. So like. The Leatherface player actually does have to, be, and you've got a stamina bar that's limiting whether you can run or every time you attack. So you do actually have to be good at what you're doing. Yep. It's just you only need to be good once. Whereas yeah. the victims <laughs> have to be good constantly. Constantly, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so there's a steep. Here's the thing, though. So it is a steep learning curve. It can be very frustrating playing it at first. But the one thing I would argue that has turned me off to these asymmetrical horror games in the past was that they were too simple. 
Mm-hmm. Like after you played them it for like a day. Definitely doesn't seem to be the problem here. No, but. it's the it's the opposite, which makes me wonder if this game will actually have legs. I mean, that's a good question because I mean, yeah, I think like Dead by Daylight, I have not played much of, but it's like it's like oh, it's, once I found it's like oh, it's just this every time you just activate these three things, right? And, that's the game. Yeah, uh, that turned me off. This it is different every simple. time. It really... every, but you're right. Like, this is gonna. And I mean, the, clearly the developers' uh, uh, message also. Like, they expect you to get good at this. Yeah. And it's like, how many people are gonna have the patience to do that? Especially when it scares the living crap out of you. Again, I know you're like Teflon when it comes to horror and being scared, mm. but I've, I have a pretty good constitution, and this scared the living crap out of me, dude. Like, literally, my heart I thought was gonna explode out of my chest i could see my shirt moving i looked down and my shirt was moving from my heart mm. pounding like that's how terrifying moments of this game see, are in situations like this especially games like this i'm i'd just be irritated oh really because i leatherface isn't scary to me in this game because he's some asshole playing on some xbox somewhere i'm just like oh fuck you I, I, yeah I, so I, you, you you don't just suspend like disbelief anymore i don't know what point in your life it came to where you couldn't do that anymore but I don't want to be that way. I like getting scared, like playing stuff like this. Like that's why I play it. Like mm-hmm. if it didn't do that, I probably wouldn't play it at all. Like, but well, now you're now you're where I am. <laughs> there you go. I mean, but I do enjoy it because I do get scared at stuff. So see, I'd rather enjoy the actual game, and this is yeah. enjoyable. This kind of game is not particularly enjoyable for me for exactly all the reasons you're explaining. It's like it's like yeah, it takes too long to do the thing, and I know that's part of the balance. I mean, I don't know if it's balance. It sounds like it. Sounds like it's a it is unbalanced, unbalanced right now until yeah. you maybe get, but like yeah, like that's just annoying to me. That's yeah. not like I'm, it's it's almost the same annoying as watching the movie where it's like yeah, I would be faster about that if I were in that situation. But, I, so look at this whole moment right here. So this is our last person standing on our team, and I'm just mm-hmm. gonna go back very quickly here, just to show you kind of what you do in this game. So she got up here, she didn't realize that right down there is Grandpa, mm. and no, so she sees. So can Grandpa be anywhere? No, he's, he's almost always outside. Really? Yeah, he's already yeah. out there. Yeah. And then she realizes, and I didn't go back far enough, but then the person playing this character realizes, oh, crap, they're all down there. Yeah. So she goes back up the stairs and is like, and all they have to do is go up those stairs and discover her, and she's done. And But they don't. And so she managed, they leave, and she manages to sneak out when it's only Grandpa there and get out here. And then at this moment, I was like, oh, my God, someone's finally going to beat them. They're finally going to get out of here, and they don't. Mm. <laughs> Earlier, someone did escape. They, the no, they didn't. Sneaky Pete did. No, he didn't get out. It said Sneaky Pete got out. No, but I didn't. You didn't see it in the B-roll. You didn't see it. it was, yeah. It was... So here's here's the, the really the thing about this game is that you have this all about learning the maps. Like the hardest part about this is you don't know where anything is. So you're just running around with the, like a chicken with your head cut off trying to find. Actually, there's like five maps in this, right? There's, there's eight. Several, there's eight. Yes. Wow. So you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to find the tool to get out of the door. So once you find that was also a problem with Friday the 13th. I mean, I had fewer maps, yeah. but like there was that thing about like, I don't know where everything is and Jason doesn't need to know or anything. And that was the yeah. same developer. So yeah. Yeah. So sneaky Pete, Chances are he knew, he where knew he exactly going. where everything is. He knew exactly what door to go out of, how to get to the closest door out of the house once he got upstairs, yeah. and then how to snake his way through the outside to get out of like the. And that was Friday the Thirteenth too, where you'd start a game and somebody would be like, "I know what I'm doing, just follow." Just follow me, me around, and yeah. you would always, you know, you'd get to the car, he'd fix the car, you'd get in the car and drive away. I know yeah. that was it. Like, yep. So every once in a while you come across somebody like that, but like I never saw anybody escape. Like you're right, maybe somebody did it while I wasn't looking or whatever. Because again, you're you're together, but you're not in this game. Like people can escape without you, well, and you're happened, still stuck inside. What happened in the B-roll was he was he was, he opened the like an outside gate and was running down a dirt path, and then suddenly it cut back to a different survivor who was in the, oh. the house, and then it said Sneaky Pete got off gotcha, the thing. Gotcha. So I think he crossed the line, ah. and, and then the spectating dropped to another survivor who was still playing. Yeah. And then once you get to the door, as you actually get outside. There's a new mini game that's even more nerve wracking that you can see right now. It takes probably a minute and a half to open a door to get out to the outside. And while you're here in mm. the chainsaw firing up in the background, well, it's just nerve wracking. One of the characters, I think Connie can open locks really fast. faster. Yeah, we yeah. saw her earlier. She was at that outdoor lock. Yeah, and it, just went, it unlocked yeah. like that. Yeah. So each victim has their own special abilities and they're better some are faster at running some are better at opening locks all of them have their own advantages and disadvantages and it's like you would think oh the guys are the strongest no actually Mm -hmm. like the the strongest character in the game is a girl 
So I thought this girl was going to make it out too. And next thing you know, here he comes running outside because he was nowhere to be found. (laughs) But watch this. She waits him out. He runs into these weeds and doesn't see her. She runs right past her, never sees her. And she still doesn't make it out alive. But (laughs) Uh, the final girl, perhaps, Sarah Dahl says. Yeah. Mm. So um, I really enjoyed this a lot. I felt like I had kind of gotten the hang of it. Look how close this is. Just run right faster. Zoom. Yep. Um, I just, I kind of gotten the hang of it. Like whenever I had to kind of stop playing and, you know, edit together our B roll so we I can talk say, about I mean, it. I will say it's, it's, it's not inauthentic how he runs, but he really looks like a dork. That's how he runs in the like, movie. It is, yeah, it is true. You got to remember, like, they're, they all have mental. There's a difference mental... between how you frame it in a movie and just having the character run around in broad daylight yeah. in the middle of a game. And you're like, oh, yeah. I would feel really bad if you killed me because that's that's embarrassing. <laughs> well, they're all inbreds, yeah. and so they all are mentally disabled, basically. It's like being killed by a bunch of internet trolls. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I saw somebody, Cinetike, said, oh, now after you played this, now you can watch Terrifier 2. I already watched Terrifier 2, Cinetike. Yeah, I thought you already saw that. Yeah, I already saw it. Yeah, I watched it like a couple months ago or whatever. It was on Amazon Prime. I can watch it for free. Um, Erebus Jones says, this feels like the third attempt, at least, at doing this sort of asymmetrical multiplayer game based on horror movies. All the others seem dead. Has this got any real chance at a future? So I do think this has a better chance because it is deeper. It has yeah. more features. The other important part, too, is it it's actually... people are going to have the patience. It, that's the X factor. You need good people to play with who won't get frustrated. Like, I found one person to play with who, like, kept helping me, and they were amazing. But at the same time, there's two other people like complaining about what I'm doing. You need to get over here. You need to do this. You need to do that. It's like, bro, I just learned how to play this. I'm, I'm just learning. So my guess, so this is actually coming on Game Pass. Where's she going? She has to go and like unhook the the generator, the battery from the car. That's what I'm saying. Like you never, you always think you're about to escape, and you never can. There's always some last. And look, here you go. Yeah. Going back to get well, the battery in the car. That's, that's the next thing that she has to do. How is she supposed to do it? What do you mean? If they know that she needs the battery from the generator, what just... Well, they don't know where she is. They thought she may be still down in the basement trapped inside. Right, but if like she, they know she needs that generator, the, the battery, why don't they just camp the battery? Because... How do you get people away from the things you need? I mean, they could just sit there forever, I guess. Yeah. And eventually, but do you want the game to go on for like two hours but waiting for them to show well, it up? can't because the, the victims are dying. So well, like, they know that there's one girl left or one character left, but they have no idea where that character is. So... Mm-hmm. But if you hear the that gate open, you know she's going the place she. They needs didn't the hear battery. the gate open though. But she did it without it? making any noise. That's the key. So if you're opening something, Grandpa doesn't know you're there. Like that, that won't Only, trigger. No, no. So you can open stuff while he roars, and, mm-hmm. the, and it won't detect you. Um, but if you if you move while he roars, then it will detect you. But you can like rifle through like a toolbox and like unlock a door stuff like that doesn't it he won't detect it so and if if he gets max level he just sees everyone it's when he gets to max level it's full on radar Mm -hmm. they know exactly where you are get the hell out of there basically um and as you play this as you're seeing Um. right now in the (laughs) b-roll you level up your victims and you get like perks and new abilities that help even more again when i was playing this i was lower level than everybody else so they had a lot of this stuff like you do have a special ability you you use with uh, R1 on an Xbox controller and they're on cooldowns or whatever but like each character has their own special ability and like some of them are, give you radar so you can see where the family is blah 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 um, and as you can see there's a, a full on tree that you can go through and max out your characters I think there's three yeah three or four different levels of yeah three levels of um, improvements that you can make to your character uh, so there is some light RPG elements in there um, but I do think I think ultimately, I do think the depth of this gives it a chance to last longer than the other games. And the other thing, too, is that they announced today as well that they have secured the license for this for perpetuity. So it's not going to be another Friday the 13th because this is from the same studio. Yeah, I would imagine that if I was them, I would do that first. Because they got burned. Yeah. On Friday the 13th. And part of that is because the Friday the 13th license is a, a giant mess. clusterfuck. I mean, it is, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, there's documentaries about how fucked up the licensing, license holding is for the Friday the 13th stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the thing that the, the type of game of this that I would be most interested in would be Nightmare on Elm Street. 
mm. because the dream stuff lets you be mm. way weirder and more that's creative, true which it was always my favorite of those of the horror franchises in the 80s yeah because it had to me it had more creativity on display you could do anything you wanted yeah if you can go into freed, dreams you can do whatever the yeah, hell you want freed up the effects people to come up with cr the craziest stuff they could think of like it was always something interesting to see even if the story was sort of the same every time mm -hmm. um like all you got to do is make a game out of dream warriors people like it's, it, and all the different characters can be weird you know it become weird stuff from the dreams like you could almost have them be classes and stuff yeah like there's a lot of po possibility there i don't know what the license issue is on that it would also be harder because you'd have to be putting a lot you couldn't just do a bunch of you know texas maps you'd have to have a bunch of weird dreamscapes and yeah. things like that but if, again it, it opens up the creativity for the developers yeah. and too. you'd have to come up with a like you'd have to there'd have to be a way where like the the survivors would have to like be in the waking world and freddy and you couldn't get to each other but maybe you could hurt him but he'd have to yeah. find a, he'd have to wait to like make you fall asleep and maybe you wouldn't realize you'd fall you'd do like a like a sanity effect from eternal darkness thing where you don't know if you're asleep or not yet right right like there'd be a lot of cool <laughs> shit you could do yeah. with that I, I will say, I think this is the best one of them all so far. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there is a steep learning curve. But again, it's going to be on Game Pass day one. Yeah. And I think that's... I just wish it had... Um, honestly, I just wish it had a better license. Because I feel like th that's the biggest hurdle is... I don't think a lot of people care about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, let's be honest, Matt. Most people only know Leatherface. Yeah. That's it. They don't know yeah. even the other characters from the OG Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I, obviously they have names in this. I don't yeah. know if they already had names in the, or if those are names in the fandom or if I. They're, I think they're mostly names from fandom. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I did enjoy this game. It scared the living bejesus out of me. It scared me more than Terrifier 2. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> like Terrifier 2, I didn't find scary. I just found it disgusting. Um, this is scary. Um, and again, it is coming to Game Pass on day one. I think it's going to be there today, maybe actually. I think the game comes out today. And I think it's is maybe it, on Game Pass right now. That could be, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the, I, the 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 release date I saw on on uh, Wikipedia I think was the 18th, but I think it's early yeah. on Game Pass. Well, the embargo was today, so we're not okay. breaking embargo talking about this. But um, but if it does come out on Friday, give it a go. Like I would even recommend buying this at like 20 bucks, if particularly if you're a horror fan There's and no you know a little bit bucks, something though. something about Texas Chainsaw. There's no way this is 20 bucks though. You don't think so? No, not with a license. I'd say this has to be forty. Uh, maybe I wouldn't pay that much for it, even though this is the I'll, most robust of these games. I'll make sure, but like I, I would be stunned if this was. That's what I would pay for it. I'd pay twenty, twenty-five bucks for it. I'd pay twenty if you don't really care about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'd pay twenty-five if you're a big Texas Chainsaw Massacre fan, which I personally am. I did watch all the movies. In fact, I just watched the yeah, latest one. It's 40 bucks. 40 bucks. That's too much. Um 35.99, 10% off on Steam. Mm -hmm. But uh uh yeah. Yeah. Coming August 18th on Steam. Sneaky says this would be great if three real friends know what they're doing. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. It's terrifying. Like it see you you would see who your friends really are playing this game i'll put it to you that way when the pressure's on that's when you figure out who people really are and this game puts the pressure on at all times like there were times too where like you get down to the last person and that person is just losing their mind and they're on their mic just going oh my god oh my god like it's just crazy like i had a good time playing it if you enjoy being scared which i do um i had a lot of fun with it and a lot of you can just try it for free on game pass if you want to and i think also matt i think if you are making a game like this it is almost a necessity to put it on game pass yeah you want people to try this for free that is your ticket to a successful game if this is the type of game that you're making you should try mm. everything you can to get it on game pass they've done that um, and I do think your mileage will vary. I think that vary. kind of stuff and all those like PVE, like mm -hmm. alien games yep. and things like that. Those are point. important. Yep. Um, That's an important way to do it. Yeah. And your mileage will vary with this a little bit. Like if, look, if you're terrified of scary movies, this might kill you. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but if you can handle scary movies, it's still very intense. Um, and I think a lot of your enjoyment are gonna de is going to depend on how much you can kind of let yourself go and like just fall into the role of playing this yeah. game. I think one of the other downsides of it, not just getting good at it, but like it, f it looks to me like there's so much you have to do and all the work you have to put in to try to get out that I can imagine like getting killed at the end of it is going to be really irritating because you've already worked so hard to get where you got to and then have to have it all go out the window just because Leatherface happened to be able to find see you once and hit you with a chainsaw. It's like... Man, fuck you. I, it's, there is a little bit of that There's in this something game. to be said for Dead by Daylight being so simple, because at least when you lose, it doesn't feel like you 
worked all day to make it <laughs> for happen, nothing you know yeah. it's, like, it's like okay well that's done let's try it again like it's... that's what i was getting at though when i said like playing this game it feels like what it would be like to be in this situation just like so frustrating so hopeless mm -hmm. that's that's well, the feeling that this well, it game sounds like you should on be me. playing the family then right yeah I mean, if you want to win, you should play as the family. Yeah. yeah. But then you have to play as the family. And they, like, the, you know, the noises that they make and everything. Like, when you're hiding in one of those rooms and, like, they're walking back and forth making their insane, like, mm -hmm. mentally disabled noise. Like, it's scary as crap, man. Like, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I, but I do think it is for a specific audience. If you did enjoy Friday the 13th or you did enjoy Dead by Daylight or any of those similar games, you're going to like this one too. But just go into it knowing it's a little more involved. It's a little more complicated. There's a bigger learning curve. And I do hope that ultimately there's a better payoff. But again, I never escaped. So I, that feeling must feel great when you get out of that last gate and yeah, run out on the highway. Better be one hell of an XP bonus. <laughs> it's, it's, seriously. You, your, your level should go wham, wham, wham. wham. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there you go. That's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, it's available for pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. um, except for Switch. It's not available for Switch yet. Although my guess is it'll come eventually. Um, but it is available for both PlayStations, both Xboxes, and PC. And again, as I said, it is free this month on Game Pass. Give it a go and get scared. All right, next up. We're going to go back to Baldur's Gate. Have you got there yet, Matt? What? To, to Baldur's, Baldur's Gate, Gate? No. in the game. <laughs> Me either. No. I'm still in what the devs say, the tutorial. <laughs> Act 1. The 50-hour tutorial. <laughs> yep. So I have continued to play Baldur's Gate 3 in the midst of all this other stuff that I've played this week. Um, I have added probably an extra 10, 11 hours onto it or something like that. It's so nice yeah, to be able to play I, this on the couch. I've probably played like four or five more hours than the night of the show last week. The other thing that I discovered, too, that's really annoying playing this, at least for me, playing it with a controller, the map gets borked playing it with a controller. If you go to the map, it's just a black screen. It'll show, really? yep, it'll show your icon. It'll show all the waypoints, but everything else is gone. It's just black. Hmm, I haven't had that. That's annoying. I haven't had that happen. Have you played with a controller? Yeah. Oh, you have? Not a lot, but sometimes I'll switch the controller if I'm not in a fight for a long time. I just want to run around. Have you explore. checked the map with a controller? Oh, yeah, because I'm trying to figure out where I'm going. So I'm, kind of, I'm trying to figure out if like this is just an anomaly for me. It or might, if it's it like might just a, be your drivers or your card. Or, or a could Steam be a, Link problem, maybe? That could be. I don't. I don't know. Uh, well, you wouldn't think. I'm not use. I'm not using Steam Link, so I don't know. But yeah. I haven't had. A, I haven't had any problems with stuff like that. I have, and I sometimes I will go back to my PC and like switch over to PC very quickly to look at the map, and then go back out to the living room and continue mm. playing on Steam Link with the controller. Uh, but I've played another. So ten... if you switch with a controller on on the com main computer, you can still see the map, and it's just not there on the Steam Link. No, the other room. no the con I've never tried it with a controller in the PC. Mm. I go back and I just switch back to PC mode very quickly. Because it makes me wonder if like, if it's some like calibration thing with a controller where it's instantly sw like swishing you down to the corner of the map that you haven't uncovered, so it's all black because That's, you're not you're not no, centered on your. It's character. not because I can see my character's icon and mm. I can see the waypoints. Weird, like the mission objectives. Yeah, so, I have not had that happen. It's annoying. That's one drawback for me that's been playing it. But I've played another ten or fifteen hours, and I'll say this, Matt. Your complaints about the dice, as time has gone on, I don't know if they did this in a patch or whatever, it feels like I win almost every roll. Hmm. Like, I, yes, last night I was playing, and I chose, like, some, like, coercion thing and a dialogue option, and my, I'm a paladin, so, you know, my chances Along of... Along with, like, half the other people playing it. Right, apparently one. everyone's a paladin, I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah. But anyway, I'm a paladin, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this, and sure enough, when the dice roll came up, I needed a 20. Mm -hmm. And I had a plus two and a minus one, so a plus one overall, and I rolled a 20. And then with the plus one, got the 21. Like, and I made Oh, that doesn't roll. even matter. 20 is a, 20 right. is a success. Right, all I needed was no 20. But, but I made a the roll. 20 is always a success, a one is always a failure. So after our conversation last week, I started like subconsciously keeping a rough count. And it seems to me like 85, 80% of the time, you win the roll. Like, it seems very generous. Mm-hmm. Um, so as time has gone on, like I haven't really found that I I've find I find the conversation rolls more generous than the combat rolls. I'd probably agree with that, actually. Yeah, yeah, that seems about right. 
Um, but I haven't found it to be as annoying. I, like you, I did find it annoying at first. I'm like, why should I ever not be able to do this? I get it's D&D, but shouldn't this be happening under the hood? Like, do I need to see the dice roll exactly? Like, because other games it, do it, but it's just an algorithm that's running. It's, it's more that, like, there are things you have to roll the D24 in this game that, like, you just, no DM would make you do. Yeah. Like, it's just. I can see that. It, it's. You, you do it for the big important stuff. You don't do it for like you're just talking to somebody about swords or something. Yeah. It's like, like if you're especially if your character is proficient or knows that stuff. Like you just let that happen. Yeah. It's 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 fiddly. It's it's rules rules lawyery, and it's mm-hmm. and I don't like it. Um, so yeah, it's it's just it's it's not horrible. It's just like it's just like ten percent too random for me. Yeah. Um, and I can obviously mitigate that with mods and stuff yeah. on PC. Just get rid of it all I if worry you about PS5. I'm the one, of the the biggest, and it's not like it's unplayable. Otherwise, you just gotta be ready to lo- save and load a lot, or live with the consequences of randomness and yeah. have it not bother you, which plenty of people seem to be able to do, judging yeah. by how much everybody <laughs> likes this game. Yeah. But for PS, I think the 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 core of the PS5 being able to recommend it for me is how fast it's gonna load. How yeah. fast can you load a save on the PS5? That's, that's another thing I should have mentioned about the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The loads in that are really long. <laughs> it's like, why? It does <laughs> take a while. Even just to get into the lobby. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why. Uh, but anyway, so I played an extra 10, 11 hours-ish, something like that. And I got to this section where you invade this goblin outpost or whatever. And there's three goblin leaders that you need oh, yeah. to kill. I've done that, yeah. And I was just blown away by that whole scenario, how you can just approach it any way that you want. You mm-hmm. can kill them in any order you want, and it affects how each one of them, how everything then plays out, like, afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like That's what I was talking about with, like, last week where I was like, I, I couldn't figure out how to get through that one character, so I had to kill her before she had time to... That was one of the leaders. Oh, of okay. So that was how I started that, and then I took oh. the druid, and he's like, "Oh, you need to kill all three of these people." I'm like, "Well, I'm one down." Yeah, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they're not easy, man. No, like the, a couple of them are, very, and like one of them, like almost doesn't want to fight. It's just like sort of cult leadery and doesn't. Well, th- so here's the thing: like this is where I started understanding the depth of this game. So I, want, I'm not going to spoil which one, but I went to fight one of the goblin leaders, and the first time, like we go into a private room. And Mm -hmm. you go to attack her, and she calls in, like, the army. And I don't even know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Did you make it through that? That's what I was talking about. That's what you're talking about. The one I had to kill, and I threw her in a box. And just so I killed her before she could. I reloaded until I killed her before her turn came up, so she couldn't call the army. Okay. And I threw her corpse. That's in what a you're box. talking about. That's, okay. That's how I got through that. Well, here's what because I Because otherwise, she calls in that fucking shopkeeper who like is casting like uh-huh. fireball. I mean, I keep that. The yeah. first time she ran in, she killed my half my party with one shot. Like there was nothing. Well, I could the parties do. they're forced to stay outside. Well, I didn't make them stay outside. How did you get him to come in without her shutting the door and forcing them out? I just came, they just came in. And really? Then she, and then she'll say, she'll say like, your rest of your party needs to leave. I mean, we need to. And, and, the first time I sent them out, and then she did her horrible shit to me. And then the second time, I'm like, well, no, I'm not leaving. I'm just having the, the Githyanki kill you. Like, so, oh. so that's how I did that. But here's how I did it. And this is why this game is so freaking awesome. I silenced her. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And good. she went to call for the backup, and then no one came. And I just killed her ass. There you go. I didn't have a silence because uh, I didn't have my wizard with me. Oh, well, the other... So then th- one of the other leaders, it's like you have this fight on this, like, bridge or whatever. I get my ass kicked left and right. And then I realize, just walk right up next to her and use the push. Push her just, off the bridge. I just yeah. pushed her off the bridge. Like, this game is insane, There's also, Matt. like, in the, like, the, in it the is third, insane. In the third one, I didn't recognize this until after I won the fight. But he's in between two giant statues, and you can push those statues over oh, onto yeah. him. Here's how I beat him. I picked up a pot and took it over and sat it next to him before I initiated the conversation. <laughs> so we do the conversation. I here, start the no fight. Reason. Yep, I shoot the pot. It took like 80% of his health. Like mm. This this game is incredible. So last week, I remember I was like, yeah, I could probably maybe get it to the high eight. Like I, am under, I understand now where these mm. high review scores are coming from because this game really does stuff that no other game does. Like, there's, I've never played a game that just literally, if you can think of anything. So here's another thing. So there was this village where I kept getting attacked. I went in. I snuck in there. I put poison in their drink. In their, like, so if you go in there, mm-hmm. everyone's talking about, oh, I had my fourth cup. I, I'm drunk and blah, blah, blah. They're like, they're, it's a hint. And it took me a while to connect the dots. And I was like, oh, 
the game is telling me there's somewhere where these people are all drinking from that I could, and I found it and I poisoned it and everybody in the village died. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's just like you can, anything you think of, you can do it in this game. And I've, I don't know if I've ever played an RPG that that was that. Because you you didn't play enough original sin too. Maybe. Because they, you're right. They're very, all the same. People say it's very similar. It's not like on the same, you know, it's obviously worse a little different because D and D is that. And this is it. But like, that was the same. It's like, okay, you can throw, you know, like, oh, these guys are on fire and they can throw water on them. They can't do anything now. Yeah. Or like, throw water on yourselves. You're immune to fire damage now. Yeah. Like, it, like so the, it, the flaming demons can't do anything to you, and now you've got f- water on your weapon, so you're doing double damage to them. It's that kind of thing. It's yeah. amazing, man. It really is. And I did not play yeah. Divinity that much. But again, much. there's problems where, like, you know, okay, I'm like, okay, I recognize that this statue, I could do that. I could knock this over onto this party, you know, the goblins that are having a party, and that'll kill a bunch of them before I can, and I might be able to get out in time. But of course, now you got to roll a die to see right. if you push the thing <laughs> right and see, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, you push it now everybody knows you're trying to now you're gonna fight now it's a reload it's like yeah it's like you know the the randomness is what like sinks a lot of it for me but i was like that's what i mean when i continually say that this is a huge achievement in game design and and the freedom and the scope and the breadth of everything you can do i just you know if i was playing this on console i would be going crazy about <laughs> how i could not change the things that annoy me i think they're game. gonna tweak all that stuff for console release i really do Mm -hmm. i think they'll tweak like a lot of stuff for it um mike's q is asking did we find the three trolls for hire i did not i don't know what he's talking about so i obviously didn't find them i didn't find trolls for hire i found ogres for hire uh that were like the with the one that could talk yeah though the the smart one smart ogre i haven't seen any trolls i don't think yeah but it's everyone's here's the thing about this game everyone's story is different Everyone thinks about things differently, takes different approaches, and you can make progress in this game no matter what your approach is. Like, and then you just pile in all the other stuff that's just done to an expert level. And like, I now I can understand where people who had played this game a lot more than I did were like, "Oh, this is a nine plus." Um, it really is remarkable mm-hmm. the achievements in this game, and I'm gonna absolutely keep on playing until I have to start playing Starfield. Like all these other games I was playing during the week. It was pulling me away from this. I wanted to go back and play this yeah, all I'll, week. I'll admit that I'm just sort of like, I don't know. Like, if this played a little more like a standard action game, if this played a little less random, if this played... Because the other thing is, like, maybe this... Because I also don't think the controller quite solves my issues with it, but, like, like I, every time I play this and I'm, I'm starting to move around, like... I, it's just it's just a little too constrictive in I the agree. camera. I agree, like, man. And trying to click around, it's and annoying, trying to move dude. around, it just does. I just feel yep. claustrophobic. I feel it. the same way. And like it's if it pulled back like ten more feet, yeah. it would be fine. But I just feel I guess like it's the engine in, buckles. And or there's something. moments where I'm just like I'm trying to click. I want to go over here. I'm trying to click over here, and I accidentally click the back of the head of the party member that's in the foreground. And now I'm talking to them, and I can't. And now the camera's pointing that other direction. And I'm just like. Oh, I've can healed. I, just, I have can healed. I just navigate the fucking environment, please. And like, it, I've healed the ground probably fifty oh, times. Fuck that! Like, you, how in the world does that not hold like command or I something? Know, like, you I should know. never. And there's no take back. There's no uh-huh. rewind. It's just like no. Yeah. It, why? Don't let me do something that no one would want to do nine times out of ten unless I'm commanding you to do it. Yeah. Even even like Diablo gets that right. Yeah. It um, has issues. I'm not saying it's perfect. But the stuff that it does well, so all, it does yeah, so damn well. All that stuff well. is great, but I feel like I have to wade through a mediocre game to get to the amazing game design. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you strip all that away, this game is kind of a 7 out of 10. Yeah, like if it was, I can understand If it was just the combat and the moving around, yeah. that made me kind like of blows. Seven. I mean, if it's just the combat, I don't even know if it hits a 7, honestly. Oh, yeah. But, like... You know, be a pile all the all yeah. the other stuff on top. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. But there's sort of an element to me of like, I wish it was on top of a better game. Yeah, you know, this will definitely be in my short list for game of the year toward, at the end of the year, though. It'll yeah, be something I, would, I consider. I would think so. I mean, it, I mean, certainly it's up. It would be up for a lot of technical awards. For yeah, me. yeah. Um, we'll see how everything stacks out in the end, and you know how Starfield does, how yeah. Spider Man does, how. Mario does. I mean, there's a lot there's to come still. There's so many other games there's to come lot, yeah. still. It's crazy, dude. I mean, I'm an old, <laughs> really old nuts. I'm an old time Assassin's Creed fan. You yeah. Know, Mirage, they nail that. Mirage might nail it. Yeah. We don't know. You know, it's possible. Like, so yeah. But I, I wanted to come back and any talk about other this year. Again. Yeah. This yeah. Would be a oh yeah. Good shoe in. Yeah. 
But I wanted to come back and talk about it again because, you know, I told you how much I had played it last week, and obviously people who had reviewed it had played it a lot more than me, and anytime my opinion on something changes or is altered a little bit after I play more, I'm going to come back and tell you guys. And so my impressions of this game have definitely gone up even further from when I talked about it last week, and still I'm only... 30 some 40 hours in or something like that like there's still so much more to go it's just and i still haven't got the Baldur's gate yet either so it's just a beast and uh again like you know the timing of it's a little unfortunate because there's a lot of people who are not going to be anywhere near finishing that when starfield comes out and they're gonna have mm-hmm. to make the choice like dive into starfield oh, or try to finish a, off Baldur's gate for you definitely not no yeah Unless Starfield sucks. Eat Demon says it's his game of the year so far. I'm sure yeah. it's a lot of people's game of the year. Vincent so says the short list for game of the year is like 30 games. Uh, not Maybe not 30, but like 10. Yeah, you're, you're definitely making a good <laughs> argument for 10 nominees. Like 10 nominees! If the Oscars can do it, yeah. why not? I mean, this year is just exceptional, people. Like, it's hard to realize the good times while they're happening. You always look back and say, oh, those were the best of times. I'm telling you right now, try to recognize that you are living in the best of times right now. It's not like this ever. Even back in the PS2 era where we get like 80 game releases a month when it cost $2 million to make each game or whatever. You never had months like this because the fact of the matter was you could develop games for a much lower budget. So they weren't as good as these are. This is literally just banner yeah, and every other year people can like name it. So it's like okay that was the year that three good games came out in one month right but there's nothing compared i mean yeah like oh 1998 it's like you know ocarina metal gear solid and half-life all in like the space of like three weeks like yeah sure but that's three games yeah and it's like or 2007 which i don't even know what people are talking about with 2007 yeah like, i guess I've, modern warfare i haven't been able to get on that bandwagon modern warfare <laughs> and portal yeah i, I don't know weird. why people bring that up i don't know yeah. this is, i have never seen a release schedule for a year packed like this it's this insane. is this is three years worth of of game of the year stuff packed it's into amazing one. yep and Baldur's gate three just another one to just throw on the pile and here comes starfield mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just awesome um so anyway I mean, if you like RPGs, go buy Baldur's Gate 3. Or if you have to wait until the PlayStation version comes out. It looks Mm -hmm. like Xbox isn't coming until next year. But if you have to wait till PS5. It sounds like it's a problem with the S. I mean, I wonder what happens. Because the other problem, too, is... At some point, you got to ditch the S. Yeah. Right? It's It's holding holding them back back. It's not just holding, like, Xbox games back. It's holding all games back. Developers have started talking about it. Like, the S is, like screwing things up for us Mm -hmm. like development wise like well if you're going to end up in a situation like this where like this big huge game this game that everybody's talking about that's the highest rated game of all time it's coming out on your platform half a year late because they can't figure out how to make it work on this stupid legacy like old previous let's be honest previous gen system that you force everybody to try to take into account at least they gave up on switch what what good (laughs) well what good is the s doing you with that i know it's, I mean, we've talked about it before. It was useful as a transitional it's, tool, but it's over. Well, it's there for Game Pass is what it, why it exists. Sure. It's so like, people can buy a cheap console and then get Game Pass. But you're going to hit a point where not everything works on it. Right? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, and it's, especially, it's like, do you want, wouldn't it be better if Baldur's Gate was available on Xbox on September 6th alongside PS5? Yeah. Although, do you not care about that? I feel sorry for the PlayStation owners who don't have a PC who have to decide. Well, they don't have to decide. They don't, they're not going to be able to play uh, Starfield anyway. So No. Yeah, I guess it, actually, it worked out organically this for them. This is their Starfield. Yeah, this is their Starfield. And, I mean, not bad. Yeah, I mean, not a bad replacement. So I'm pretty sure Starfield's not going to beat that Metacritic yeah. average. So Yeah. Uh, well, you never know. I'll say this. I'm very I'm, happy about I'm these numbers confident. for my fantasy team. I'm pretty confident. Saying that that's <laughs> I, I never dreamed Baldur, with my Baldur's Gate pick I would get the highest scoring game ever. Like I figured like eights or something. Oh, like. I thought this was going to be in the nines yeah. for sure. Maybe I should have picked it earlier. You but. should have. Well, what, what, what pick was it? Three? I think it was my fourth, my third or fourth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty up there. I mean, because I, I, I got Zelda and I don't remember. I mean, I knew it. that you wanted it. I mean, yeah. I knew that you knew it was great. So I picked it a little earlier than maybe I wanted to. And it all worked out. But mm-hmm. we'll see at the end of the year. Uh, but anyway, Baldur's Gate 3, go buy it. If you like RPGs, just go buy it. Like we sit here and we nitpick stuff and we complain about stuff. But the bottom line is it's an amazing RPG. If you're a PlayStation yeah. owner and you're, you well, don't especially own an Xbox. You're, well, again, if you're a PlayStation owner, wait. And see how see. fast it loads. Yeah, that's that's the key. If you if you got to sit around for a minute when you load a save game on PS5, no. Yeah, because you do need no. to load those saves pretty frequently. Like literally, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> it and is, it shouldn't is. be because obviously it's built to load fast, so yeah. it shouldn't be an issue. But yeah. if you have a PC that can run it, and that's almost every PC, judging by your PC, yeah, um, it, you can mod it into whatever you want it to be. So go yeah. ahead and do it because you want to experience it one way or the other. Yep. 
So there you go. That's our final At word. At the very least, to see what these Bioware RPGs could have evolved into right. in terms of choice and and options. I mean, that's where bo- that's where they should have been. That's where they should have ended up. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I'm glad combat wise, that's not where they went. Right, right. But like in terms of how you, and again, you do lose the char- main character, your character being able to talk, mm-hmm. which is a prop, which is yeah. too bad because because you can't have a different. You know, again, if you're going to throw all this this dice rolling in. You can't have a, a, a fail and a succeed and a super succeed and a critical fail state for every single line the character says. Yeah. But, like, you are losing a little bit of character to your character. Because, you know, everybody knows their shepherd. My character, every time they show him, he just looks pissed off. He just well, like... the, char- the facial expressions do make up for some of it because it is very good. <laughs> but, like, yeah. like, there is no sense of self that, like, Shepard has yeah, yeah. in comparison. Yeah, you, you lose that, it. So that is something you lose. And I, and I honestly, I generally would side with the shepherd idea more than the text thing i don't find the text thing very compelling um but like there's something here that's like not like anything you know it, it's it's a glimpse into a timeline where crpg is developed in a very different direction yeah i'm glad we got it so go pick it up if you like rpgs you won't regret it um next up we're going to talk about quake con but when we talk about quake con we're really only talking about one oh. thing because nothing Ar- happened at Quake. Con- Jones says not speaking has never hurt Link. A disagree. Yeah, I do disagree with that. B Link is not a character in a choice driven RPG. Right. He is a useless side character <laughs> in a very generic and almost bare bones fantasy story that's told the same way every time they make the game. The point yeah. of Link is not to talk. Well, there's no story. There's what what would say. he even yeah. say? <laughs> He's such a non-entity in the story that in the new one, they literally shunt Zelda into another time period right. so they don't have to worry about him anymore. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, anyway, we're moving on. We're talking about QuakeCon 2023, which they finally had in person again. Um, there really were no big stories coming out of QuakeCon. You may have even forgot that it even happened this weekend. If I guess it wasn't for Quake 2, I would not have noticed. Right. Um, John Carmack showed up at QuakeCon. Oh, because he's allowed to now. Because <laughs> he's not he's no longer being sued by Zenimax and Bethesda <laughs> for like stealing their technology or whatever. Whew. He finally showed back up and like people celebrated and that was the biggest story oh, yeah, from the, QuakeCon. The Quake fans never had a problem yeah, with him. Right. And that was really kind of the biggest story coming out of QuakeCon, yeah. other than we got a is it a remaster or um i'd call it a remaster yeah. yeah it's got new it's got other content mixed in it's got new options it has new items it has new ways to, it, it has modern conveniences some <laughs> so quake 2 just shadow dropped for everybody um in the middle of quake con uh, we got the announcement and it was up for downloads it's on game pass right now if you're a game pass subscriber you can play it totally for free matt did you play this at all yeah i did what did you think of it I liked it. I mean, it's Quake You liked two. it? Yeah, it's Quake 2. Wow. Um, <laughs> I thought this is the worst game I've played in like 10 years. It's Quake 2. It's so bad. Like, I'll say this. It really shows you how far shooters have come. A lot of people say shooters never change. They stay the same. They're stagnant. Oh, no. Play this, and you'll see the evolution of this over... This was launched in, what, 97? Is that right? That sounds about right. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, about that. So it's like 26 years old. Yeah. Is The genre has definitely evolved in many well, ways. We're inventing for it the better. at this point. This is, what, this is the second Quake game. Yeah. You know, the Quake was the first real 3D uh-huh. engine shooter. Mm-hmm. So you basically had this and, you know, eventually Quake 3 would come out and go up against Unreal uh, Tournament. But this was like, it was this and Quake and Unreal were sort of yeah. your... Your first big 3D, really pushing the 3D thing. And then the next um, year, the Voodoo 2 thing, card came out, and, and then and things took thing off. And this thing is, uh, I mean, Quake 2 is the weird one of of the Quake series, because it's a completely different storyline. Mm-hmm. Well, it's It has nothing to do with any of the other Quakes outside of some characters appearing in Quake 3, which is, has no story to begin with. It's a whole sci-fi we're invading this other place. It has nothing to do with the first Quake. It's a whole standalone thing. Um, and I mean, Unreal kind of did that too. Where like, Unreal is way too long for its own good, and is a very story-driven alien planet game. Mm-hmm. This is sort of the same, except it's got that same sort of loosey goosey, slidey. I mean, it's very hard to control with a controller now. <laughs> um, the jumping, in particular, is is not very good. Um, also, there's so many hit scan weapons in this. From the enemies have so many hit scan weapons that you're just like, oh my god, there's no way to dodge any of this. Now, um, we did, look, we just played an old older shooter, Bolt Gun, that I loved. 
Mm-hmm. I thought it was amazing. That game actually took modern contrivances and incorporated them in an older style game. Had a blast with it. This is just a disaster. I well, I don't agree with that. I it's hated fine. playing this game. Every I didn't like anything did about you, playing. Did you this. never like Quake Two? I did. I played I played the multiplayer out the ass. I hated that too. Playing the multiplayer in this. Mm. The, this feels exactly like Quake 2 to me. Well, yeah. Because like, it is Quake 2. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, it is. But, it, but it's like, that's what it is. It was always yeah. this. I liked it 26 years ago when things were different, when this was bleeding edge. Right. But like, I don't, Now it's just shit. It's, it's fine. It's shit, It's dude. Quake 2. <laughs> it's so bad. So you try to go for headshots in this, but you can't because they all duck. So what you yeah, do instead... headshots don't matter. <laughs> they don't matter. It's just two shots and they fall. Yeah, these guys it doesn't fall matter. Over. So you end up aiming at their knees the whole time because you know they're going to bend down as soon as you... It's just... <laughs> It's so bad. Well, if like, you're really shooting somebody, you're aiming for center mass. You're not yeah, going for a shot. Yeah. Um, and like it says that there's an aim assist in this. I couldn't feel one like at all. Um, Could you? Not really. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there is. It says in the movie, options you like, can turn it off. I'm like, dude, this is the most <laughs> fragile freaking like I mean, aim assist. This thing was never made to be played with a controller. Like, I, I didn't try it on PC. I didn't try it on a mouse. I played it on, on Xbox. I played it on, game control, on a controller, yeah. Um, and it was fun, you know, especially for, like, Game Pass free download, fine. You know, is, am, am I going to finish it? No. The game is um, so hard. It is very hard. Oh, my God. Well, they used to, they all, shooters all used to be super hard. <laughs> this is like, like the Dark Souls of first-person shooters. Like, Unreal, this, was, Unreal 1 was very hard, too. It was. Like, that guy right there with the blonde hair, it takes like 20 shots to kill him. Yeah, well, that's why you guys switched to the shotgun by now. Well, eventually, well, you don't get it yet. Well, you have the shotgun here. No, you get it in like the next room or whatever. It's but anyway, well, you know, you get the machine gun in the next room. You don't get the shotgun for another like... 10 or I got the shotgun minutes. early on, but it's in a secret area. Oh. Or in the, it's the secret area of the first room where you can get a shotgun. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I didn't I get did into like, this game fa- a fair amount back in the day. I remember some of this. I didn't remember any of it, other than like the maps in multiplayer. I remembered some of those. But I thought this played like absolute crap. Like it does actually have like a story that I didn't remember when I played it back in the day. I did. It, it's it's like weirdly <laughs> it's and it's like weirdly focused on it like, yeah it's, like, it's, it's very story driven <laughs> in a way that you're like that's so weird it's like especially i mean it's not that like there's anything wrong with a story driven fps because like unreal did the same thing but it's like it's so weird that that's the direction they went after the first quake because that first quake was the, the, the story was an excuse to go blow stuff up yeah and in this it's like <laughs> there's a war going on and you're here to do this and this is you're like a particular character well, you're bitter man you're bitter man <laughs> yeah who does you know the only thing I know about Bitter Man is when you hi- highlight him and qu- when you're selecting your fighter in Quake Three it goes Bitter Man yeah like that's it that's the only thing I know about Bitter well Man. basically that what you're doing is you're trying to stop the Strog from invading Earth before the invasion starts yeah so you're attacking their base but of course your ship goes down before you get there and you have to try to gather together the other space well, marines like, and you're all in like the little drop pods like like odst mm-hmm. and like you some guy like flies past you and damages your pod as you're going down and you're like hey somebody just hit me it's like yeah. and, I'm a, and it's funny to me because it's like imagine being like a hard bitten like hard boiled like space marine dropping from orbit <laughs> and feeling the need to contact like hq and whine that some guy got too close to you on the drop <laughs> down to another world it's like, yeah. but then it turns out that the strog have some like weird like emp thing that disables and kills everybody else dropping in the pod and you don't get killed because you got damaged just the right way by that close call yeah. that you get to land and then so you have to basically do it all yourself well i'll say this the cgi cutscenes in this are way better than any cutscenes in um atlas fallen <laughs> and this is from mm-hmm. 1997 <laughs> yeah there's some scope to them like and there's a charm there's like a, that mid to late 90s 3d like jank to it's not jank but it's like this oh is there's a little bit of jank like. um and that whole like thing where some because i remember when like when this first came out and the fact that like when you downed a guy he could still maybe get up and shoot back for a second like yeah. that was like oh my god that's so that crazy. happened but it happens over, oh, over, over and over and over and over but it was over. very novel in 1997 yeah i mean i get it i was there in 97 when this came out and i thought this game was awesome in 97 in 2023 it's a crappy game i actually eventually just even turned down the difficulty to started playing it on easy because i was like 
I'm oh, not I enjoying this. On easy. I knew I knew I wasn't. I played on medium for the first like few hours, and no, I these, just got sick of having to start over and no, over. These again. games have been. These games have always been unfair. Yeah. So I turned it to easy eventually, so I could just actually see some of the game. But like, there's just so many things that aren't in this game you're used to having. There's no. There's no crouching toggle. Like you have to hold, you have to hold it. You have yeah. to hold down the crouch button. There's I didn't no look in the options if that was a, a something you could select. No, there's no reloading weapons. So I'm constantly hitting the X button and it brings up a menu, <laughs> like over and over again. It's just habit. It's like I emptied yeah. my my gun. I need to reload. There's no reloading. There's no sprinting. There's no sliding. There's no climbing. There's just awkward jumping in this weird, like, slippery platforming. Mm. There's no aim down sights. As you mentioned, the headshots are pointless because enemies always duck and they don't really take more damage anyway. Um, I don't know, man. I was like, dang, I can't believe I played this back in the day. <laughs> My standard was so low back then. Because well, you're right. Well, because this was, it was brand new. Yeah. There was, was the standards were not low. This is simply what the state of but, the state of the industry but, was. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. Ten months later, I was playing Star Siege Tribes. So, mm. uh, <laughs> ten <laughs> months later, I was playing Goldeneye. You're right. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, I was playing. Yeah. Goldeneye, really. Actually, yeah, it came out the same year. So, I mean, Goldeneye's better than this game. Yeah. I mean, I was never a giant Quake Two fan. Yeah, I, I played it. It was it was fine. It was very pretty at the time. It was for the time. It was yeah. I mean, Unreal looked better. Well, then in '98 like, you got the Voodoo Two cards, and that's yeah. when shooters really took off. Well, Unreal took better advantage of the Voodoo Two stuff. This was this always felt like a weird stopgap thing, like this game. It was always, it was always the the odd man out in the Quake franchise. Yeah, it just they never came back to this storyline. There were no real characters that ever reappeared, other than Bitterman being a character in Quake Three Arena. It just, it's like this game never existed to the point that like when they when I saw they shadow dropped this, I was kind of surprised they even did this. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, well, the multiplayer that, is also one of those games where it's like it's a race to the best weapon. Yeah. Like you start the match, and the people who know where the best weapons are, they win the match. Well, I mean, like, that's, that's that was an id shooter in, in yeah. a nutshell. I mean, that's just me. how those shooters it's were. Also, why I didn't like Quake Three very yeah, much. Yeah, I'm just explaining why all the things that add up for me to say this game is crap. Like it's just I could go on and on about yeah, all the I things that bother I me can't about. Call it crap just because it's like it is what it is. It's a it's a 26 year old game that's here on Game Pass for free if you want to re-experience this thing you probably played back in the day and it's got a fucking new campaign in it for some reason and well, it, it has also, quake 64 in it for yeah some reason. it includes like, a bunch of stuff it's a, i mean it's a it's probably the most complete quake 2 package you could ever want oh, for if sure. you indeed wanted that yeah. for whatever reason it has quake 2 call of the machine the reckoning ground zero and quake 264 all in one package mm -hmm. and they're all crap and it has a, <laughs> and it has a compass <laughs> yeah so so anyway if you are a game pass subscriber you can go play this for free and i would not spend any money on this if they're trying to charge people for it and my guess is you'll download this on game pass you'll play it for about 45 minutes you'll be like i get it and then you'll never play it again that's exactly what i did i mean so, it's a perfect game pass game i guess um something you would never pay for <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people will, I'm sure. You think people will pay? Well, someone will buy it. Someone loves I mean, There's people who love Quake, too. Vincent said it's only 10 bucks, so there you go. That's people about, people will right. buy it. That's definitely right. I wouldn't even pay that for it, but if you're going to pay 10 bucks, is the right I'd price. I'd be fine having paid 10 bucks for this. Yeah. It's better that it was on. I mean, it does have all its multiplayer stuff and everything. And yeah, it's absolutely full-featured. Yeah, it's a everything, big package. Everything you remember about Quake 2 is here. Yeah. Um, there's nothing missing. As no, far as and there's tell. nothing improved either after all this no, stuff. The, the, the compass is a big improvement. Yeah, I guess you're right. Just something in one of these old 90s like labyrinthine shooters that tells you where to go. Yeah. That should be in every <laughs> single remaster of any of this shit anyone ever. Like if they're good, because I, I saw Cliffy talking about on Twitter, he's like, He's like, where's the Unreal 1 remaster? It's getting to be 25 years for that. And I'm like, man, I'd get that. But that better have that fucking compass in it. Yeah. Because I never <laughs> knew where the hell to go in that game, even back in the day. Yep. So anyway, there you go. That's Quake 2. Really the only big story from QuakeCon this year. But I think for Quake fans, maybe... There's no was... announcements or No, anything. not really. I mean, like, what do they have to... I mean, they talked about, like, Quake Champions esports and stuff like that. When but... is it next year some anniversary or something? Mm, or is that something... I don't know. I thought next year was the 25th or something. Maybe. I mean, I mean that's 26 years for that. When did so. Quake 3 come out? 25th of Quake 3. That sounds about right. Coming out soon, yeah. right? That should be it. Yep, 25th anniversary. Either next year or 99. I can't remember. But that would be 99. Next year would be 99, 25 years. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right to me. Yeah. Yeah. I but imagine anyway, you'd do something with that. Yeah, it was a 
it was a weak Quake Con, but it's good to just get people together and have stuff in person again. So minor victories right oh, now after Quake coming out of a pandemic. Steam, you already get it for free. That's nice. What did it say? If you own Quake 2 on Steam, you get this for free. So if you had it all that time, you yeah. can get the new version. That's cool. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, Fire Native, thank you for Twitch Prime, man. Appreciate that. Um, Erebus says they did come back to Quake 2. Quake 4 is literally a straight sequel to it. They've included two in the box. I forgot Quake 4 existed. Okay. In my head, Quake Quake 3 is the end of the series. Um, Business says, what's your hype level for the rumored new Quake from Machine Games? I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, look, I, this Quake 2, this game, has nothing to do with my excitement for the next Quake. Like, what, was, what was Machine Games? If that's Machine- what you're asking. Like, this is just null and void. Was like, Mach- Machine Games the Wolfenstein mm-hmm. people? Yeah. I mean, they'll probably make a good Quake. Yeah, I think they'll make a good game. Um, yeah, just because this old 26-year-old game, I think, sucks in 2023 doesn't mean I won't care about the new Quake. Like, um, it has no impact on my anticipation for the new Quake at all. So, uh, and hopefully marath- we get a look at that soon. Where's my marathon collection? Yeah. I'd it's rather have that. I think it's going to be a while, though. That's going to be never. That's yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to our last topic of today's show. And this is the game that I had lined up for last week's episode, but we didn't get to it. We uh, ended up talking about Evo for longer than we thought. Um, and that game is Venba. Have you played this, Matt? I don't even know what this is. It's a, it's also on Game Pass right now, but it's also available for purchase. It's available for pretty much all platforms. And it is a... Get the B-roll going. It is a cooking game, but it's really not. There's cooking in the game. And cooking is used as a vehicle to tell the story, but it's really an adventure game. It's really a story-driven, narrative-driven game. You play... Well, you play as different people from the family, but they are an immigrant family from India who immigrated to Canada in the 80s. Um, And the wife's name is Venba, and obviously she's the cook of the house, and so that's why the game is called Venba. But it's really about the entire family. So it starts out, it's just her and the husband, and then they... It's the, the what's really awesome about this is it sh- it shed new light for me on what it was like and probably still is like for immigrants to come to North America. And it's in Canada, but you could just as easily swap in the U.S. for this, and I think it still applies. In the beginning, they're just a couple who left India because their parents were going to force them into marriages with people that they did not want to marry, mm. which is one cultural angle that a lot of people may not understand about India and some of the other territories over there arranged marriages are a big deal big deal and so they moved to canada because they want to get away because they love each other and they want to be together but their families were like you can't these are not the people that we've chosen for you so they moved to canada to get away from that but they get to canada and they start to learn the issues of being an immigrant in a new country um he can't speak english very well so he he has a lot of experience in India that could get him a job, but he can't verbalize it very well. So he can't get jobs. So he has like a terrible job. He eventually has to take a job from another immigrant who came there with them that they hated when they got there, but he has ended up becoming successful. So he has to swallow his pride and go and work for the other Indian per- guy that had moved there with them who actually had become successful. And it's the beginning of the game. It's all about what it's the struggle of immigrants in Stranger in a Strange Land, basically. And getting over the language barrier, the cultural issues. They're about to move back to India and give up, and she gets pregnant. And once she gets pregnant, that changes everything. Because now they have to worry about their son. And can they get their son, you know, can they... Can they stay here to give their son a better opportunity at a better life and they have to put up with it? Well, as it turns out, the son has no problem at all because he's born in America, born in Canada, speaks English, has no problem with any of the cultural stuff. And in fact, once he gets to like four or five years old, his name is like Kevin. He wants people to start calling him Kevin. Mm -hmm. And so the people at school start calling him Kevin and they go to school and they realize that he has completely assimilated into Western culture and they are the ones who can't. And it just becomes this emotional vehicle that is propelled forward. The gas in the vehicle is the cooking. And the cooking stuff, I'll say this, is like complicated and pretty much all trial and error. So... The cooking is used as a vehicle to for her to connect with her family, so to speak. So when her and her husband are having marital issues and they're arguing, she solves it by cooking his favorite dish. 
um, when her son is starting to stray from their culture and become more westernized. She uses cooking in his favorite dishes from when he was a child to bring him back into the fold. But eventually, he gets into high school. He becomes a teenager where every teenager is too cool for their parents. That's just the way it is. It doesn't matter who the parents are. And they really struggle with it because he really detaches then in high school. And like goes away for his first day of college and they want to drive him there. But he's like, no, I'm going to ride with a friend instead. I don't want to ride with my parents to college. And it's just this whole coming of age story around immigrants and immigration that uses cooking, the mechanics of cooking in the game as a vehicle to call it a video game, basically. But I really found this more of just a really moving story that shed light on people that I honestly have never really had in-depth discussions with about this, what it was like for them. Um, I have a buddy who, back in my hometown of Carlisle, PA, he was from uh, Vietnam. His name was Phuc, and it's spelled P-H-U-K. And one of the funniest things that ever happened to me in high school was um, we had a substitute teacher one day, and the teacher came in, and she doesn't know how to read people's names. And she got to his name, and she paused and like looked around and goes fuck <laughs> <laughs> but anyway he was living this in my town and he was a good friend of mine and i didn't even know it but he wrote a book um called saigon and that was all about him being raised in my little hometown and what it was like for him as an immigrant well i had no clue like we were all skaters punk rockers like we it was just another friend to us. We didn't care where he came from or anything like that. Like, race wasn't a thing to us at all. In fact, we went around beating up Nazi skinheads. So, you know, he found the right group of people to fall into, but we were clueless. Like, we, we thought we were protecting him and sheltering him, but he was still going through all the stuff that this family does in this game. And so it put his book plus this really put things in perspective for me. Like, being an immigrant is tough, man. And you start to think about how we treat, a lot of people treat immigrants in America and other countries. It's disgusting, man. They're already going through so much just trying to become a part of our society and fit in. And then you have assholes like messing with them. It just, this game really hit me in the heart. And I don't, there aren't many games that do that anymore, to be honest with you. Like this game just really kind of shook me up a little bit. And again, it's like, it's not cooking mama. It's just not like, oh, and I got to get this done within five seconds and I'm under the gun and I got to, but that's not what this game is. This game is like fiddling around with stuff, trying stuff, seeing if it works. Oh, that doesn't work. Let me try this other thing. There's no pressure because the end result of the cooking is to bring the family close together. And it does happen and work in this. And so you go through their entire lives. Like at the end of the game, the husband and the wife are old and gray. The son is now a successful professional. I'm not going to spoil what happens whenever he becomes an adult because that's a really important part of the story. But anyway, this game is called Venba. It is free right now on Game Pass. It took me, I think, two and a half hours or something, three hours to finish it. And I don't regret it one bit. Like, I feel like I'm a better person after playing this game. And I don't know if there's a lot of games that I can say that about. So I just wanted to, you know, this is one of those games that I play, that I bring on to the show to talk about at the end of the show for five or ten minutes just to put it on your radar. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was edifying and I got something important out of it. And so if you're into um, consuming art for those purposes, I think you should give Venba, Venba a go. Now, what would I pay for it? Uh... 10, 15 bucks. Some of us I would pay for it. I think it is 15 or 14 or something. It says 15 on the paper. Oh, okay. So, and that's about right. Like it does take about three hours, but again, it's like, it's one of those pieces of art that will change you and how you think about things and how you think about other people. Um, and to me, a lot of times that's, that's really hard to even put a price on. So again, that's Venba. It's, it's available for pretty much everything. Um, except for, for whatever reason, PlayStation 4. I don't know why they excluded PS4. Hmm. It's for, available for everything else. Maybe PS4 comes along later on. Uh, but I highly recommend it if you're someone who enjoys playing games for more than just blowing stuff up and shooting guns, which obviously I enjoy too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not shaming anybody for enjoying that side of video games, but there is another side of them too, and there aren't enough, in my opinion, there aren't enough games like Venba. Well, I know what I'm ordering for dinner. <laughs> Yep, the power of suggestion. I also learned so much just about Indian culture, about Indian food, mm -hmm. um, and their culture in general. Like I just, re I didn't realize how little I knew about how they grew up and their customs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've learned a little bit along the way, uh, but I know so much more after playing this game. And if there just aren't that many games that do that anymore, that teach you stuff that's important. Uh, so now give me an RRR game. Uh, what game? RRR. 
Or, oh. you never watched it? <laughs> I didn't watch it. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. It was completely insane. Um, so anyway, there you go. That's Venba. I highly recommend it and check it out. Um, let's see how much time do we got here. Not much time, but we do have a little. So we will do a brief Q and A, but only after we hear from our other awesome sponsor. Experience the realm of extraordinary audio with Sound Wizardry. With a decade-long journey in sound design, we animate your movies and video games with the breath of sound. Our wide-ranging services include sound design, Foley, sound mixing and mastering, audio implementation, dialogue mastering, and the crafting of unique sound effects from freshly recorded material. Our portfolio contains Baldur's Gate 3, Steven Universe, Alan Wake 2, Gwent, Cyberpunk 2077, and more. Visit soundwizardry.com and let us transmute your vision into an auditory marvel. That's right, people. If you need any kind of sound work at all, go to soundwizardry.com. He worked on Baldur's Gate 3, and the audio in that game is ace. Um, and you heard a little bit of the audio that they worked on at the end there. Um, they are very skilled and they can help you with anything. In fact, they have helped us with Game Face on a couple occasions hmm. where I have sent them borked audio and they fixed it and sent it back to us uh, so you guys could listen to it and you were no the wise, none the wiser. You had no clue that it even happened. Um, so the people at soundwizardry.com are good people. They are sifters. They are gamers. Support them if you can. And with that, we do have a little bit of time to answer uh, one or two questions, if we answer them quickly. Um, Jam Rain just dropped <laughs> just dropped the subs in the chat right away. Jam Rain, I still owe you a game for winning. Name that game. So get in touch with me, bro, and I'll get you your code. Um, let's see. Oh, Mitchell is alive. What was the last game you completed, the last one you got to 100% or close to? Um, let's see. The last one I completed... Is happening in the chat. I mean, there. probably Spider Man won on the PC this year when I got that for the new computer. I 100% of that. Mm -hmm. um, not a new game, obviously, but it's, I can't remember the last it game. It is the last one I did that with, I think. I can't remember the last game I 100%ed. I really can't. Before that, it was probably Miles Morales. I mean, it would go back like, like that. Like, if you want to talk about me. getting all the trophies or all the achievements yeah. and that kind of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Spider-Man games. I mean, it might go back to the first four Assassin's Creed games for me. No, even then, I didn't get all the collectibles. Because there was, like, those flags or whatever. Mm -hmm. that they, There was, like, 400. Oh, I got all those. Whew. I had to play Assassin's Creed 1 four times to get all the flags because yeah. they kept glitching. Yeah. Oh, not, not the flag. The, the, the paladins kept glitching. One of the paladins kept sinking into the ground as I approached him. And because the autosave, there was no way to undo it. And yeah. he would always be gone. The only way to do it was to start in another game again. And one time I was at E3, and one of my friends who worked on the early Assassin's Creed games introduced me to someone, and I'm just like, and he's like, this is so-and-so. It's so like, it's his fault you had to play the first game four times. He didn't fix the Paladin thing. And I'm just like, mm. <laughs> I just don't have the time to play games to 100% anymore. Like, the last opportunity I had to, to do that was back when I worked at Game Trailers. I mentioned this in Ask Shane Anything last week's episode, is that, like, I have to play games so much now. Like, I'm playing games more now than I ever have in my entire life. Because at X-Play, I, I was the reviews editor there. I could kind of pick and choose what I wanted mm -hmm. to play. I didn't have to play everything. At Game Trailers, same deal. I was the reviews editor there, so I could just dole out games. I didn't have to constantly be playing something. Here, I have to play everything. And it's great in some ways, and it sucks in other ways. And the way it sucked was today, me scrambling trying to get this show together to come in here and do this show. I barely made it by the skin of my teeth. I got here way late and barely got the show ready to go. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if I'll ever 100% a game again mm -hmm. until I'm done working, probably, and I'm, like, retired then. Yeah, I guess I technically 100%ed um, Horizon Zero Dawn last year when I finally finished the expansion. Mm -hmm. Um, our last question from Mike's Q. Um, I am working on a proposal for my local library. <laughs> Hopefully I don't take it away. Um, to set up a game library, what are your suggestions for platforms I should try to support? What popular games would you stock? If price rarity were no object, what gems would you include? That's such a broad question. Yeah, I don't know. That's so huge. Um, maybe we'll I answer. Just, I just look at the top 20 sellers for each system and put them in. That's exactly what I would do. Yep. And if you can't get every system, 
I would choose one one from every gen. So I would probably choose PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, and then this gen. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But then earlier than that, like choosing between the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, that's not easy. NES, obviously. But those are hard things to put. Super in the Nintendo library. and Genesis, that's you're tough. Not, you're not of a lot of NESs that are even functioning yeah. at this point that you'd want to They hardly functioned back then. You they had know. to blow into the cartridges. <laughs> well, you're gonna have a lot of trouble <laughs> keeping those functioning. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would do. Um, I'm guessing that library doesn't have much of a budget. Yeah, that's a I mean like switches. That's a I lot guess, of money. But it's like that feels like something to be yeah, you know, whatever the price to steal would I don't know. I'd... Maybe the better call is just getting a play, one PlayStation three, the fat, that's backwards compatible with all the prior Playstations. Yeah, then you can just those things are delicate though. They are, but if you're trying to save money and, and make it work. A PlayStation fat will run you four or five hundred dollars. No, oh, it will. Because it's because specifically of that backwards compatibility. Right. Everybody wants that one. Yeah. Still though, four or five hundred bucks versus buying every con every PlayStation, you probably save money still. Maybe. 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 Make it easier at least instead of having to pull out all the consoles and hook them probably up. Be and... Easier. Probably be easier to get a few PS ones and PS twos, like cheap, like the later ones. Maybe a the sli slim ones. Slim, slim PS two is going to run you maybe thirty, forty bucks at this point. Yeah. I don't know. That's awesome of you that you're doing this. You're thinking of only disc based. You could literally games. change yeah. the lives of like all the kids in your area. Like, it could be awesome. So that'd be, that, a, that'd be a that's a tough. I'm not surprised that you're doing this, by the way, because you're awesome. Like having um, having run a game store that also kind of functioned a little bit like a rental store in terms of how quickly people would buy them and bring them back, turn them in for credit, and buy something else used. Like, yeah, that stuff gets abused. And it damn, does. It, it, like that's a hard that's a hard thing to 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 curate. Yep. Um, so anyway, that's the best we can give you. Otherwise, I think our answer would take like an hour. So mm -hmm. in the time that we have, I think that's the best we can do for you, Mike's Q. Um, and that's really awesome, man, that you're doing that for your local community. More people need to do stuff like that. Instead of trying to close down libraries, which is happening all over the country right now by crazy people. Uh, all right. Well, that's it for Game Face 354. I think that was an awesome episode, even though we didn't have a banger of a game for this one. We will for next week's, though. Um, we will. Well, for me, Madden. Oh. Madden. For me, Madden's a banger. I know for you All it's right. not. <laughs> for me and the chat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For me alone, there will be a banger in next week's episode. Um, and look, if you're watching Game Face on YouTube or you're listening to it on any of the podcast services and it's on all of them and you want to keep the show going, head to patreon.com slash sifted. That's S-I-F-T-D. It's just $4 a month to get all our content early. That's it. $4 a month. One cup of coffee. That's it. You'll enjoy that cup of coffee for five minutes. You'll enjoy Sifted for dozens of hours during the month. So if you could see it inside yourself to help us out, that would be sweet. Um, if you can't afford to, and I totally get that, I've been there before in my life where I didn't have two nickels to squeeze together, um, you can help us in other ways too. If you're listening to this on a podcast service, review the show and hopefully say good stuff, but whatever. Um, review the show on there. That makes a big difference. It helps our show bubble up. If people search for gaming podcasts, that can make a big difference for us. Or you can help us with Twitch Prime. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, the instructions for doing that are down below. Basically, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can give us a free $2.50 every month. Free. It doesn't cost you anything. Amazon gives us the money. And I think everybody's okay with getting one over on Amazon. Aren't we? Mm. Don't we all feel that way at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, there's lots of ways to help us, whether you have money or not, and we appreciate all of uh, all of it. Um, you can even just go to patreoncom sifted and just give us a dollar a month if you just want to just do it because like that stuff adds up too. It all helps, and we appreciate all of it. Uh, and also, big thanks to LS Cream and SoundWizardry.com. We have two sponsors for Game Face for the first time ever, which is just amazing. It feels amazing, um, and it makes a big difference for us. And also, don't forget. Help us out with that Twitch Prime. We had a better month last month. Let's keep the momentum going. Let's keep it going up until we can get back to where we were like a year ago. Where sell it was out really hard, sell out fast, yeah. sell out easy. That's, that's, that's yep. the plan. Yep. Just uh, like South Park. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, we'll be back next Tuesday. We're here every Tuesday at twitch.tv slash sifted games at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And that will be the case next week as well. I hope you guys have a great week. Play a bunch of awesome games. Game faces up and out. <laughs>